and project team. And as you might have just heard, the meeting is being recorded. This is an open to the public meeting. We're just thrilled to have so many of you with us here today. I unfortunately have some laryngitis and I'm gonna push my voice to the greatest extent possible. I hope everyone can hear me. I'll put my volume button up, that's as far as it goes. Um, I do request that if you're just listening right now, if you could please mute your phone. So put your phone on mute when you're in listening mode. I do hear a little bit of background noise and what's great about everybody leaving it on mute is it diminishes that background noise and stops the feedback. The key is that when you do wanna speak, remember to take your phone off mute so we can hear you and we might have to help. Um, what I wish to do right now is introductions around the virtual table. And I just wanna see if this was possible. I'm gonna to try to, we kinda of call it a lightning round. I'm gonna name a name if I see it and just ask you quickly to say who you are and your affiliation. So you quickly go off mute, say it, and go right back on mute. So this is just in the order that that participant list that Sylvia showed you, and I'm gonna run it down the list. So Troy. Hello, Tracer. Okay, you get to say who you are, Troy, and your oh, affiliation. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Troy Ramick with ICF, uh, HCP Project Manager. Welcome, Cindy. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Cindy Robert with Handcuff Source Management. Oh, there's going to be a lot of Cindy's. So that was I'm that one was pretty kind of basic. No worries. I'm just going to. And unfortunately, I can only say it with people that I see a name, and I have some phone numbers, so I can't identify you. But then I have Audrey McLennan. Yeah. Hey, this is Audrey McLennan. I'm with the U.S. Forest Service. Welcome. And then Bob Van Dyke. If you're here, you might be on mute. I might have to just try to run through this list to see if it doesn't quite work to be able to let people introduce themselves. Um, and the list is rearranging itself a little bit as I'm going. Uh, there's a person named Kramer, if you want to introduce yourself. Just went back on mute though. Okay. Uh, Alex is here with ODF. Yep, Alex with ODF, I'm helping out in uh, state lands. Great, and Becca, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm from Representative Marty Wildey's office. Welcome, Becca. Brad Pfeiffer. Yeah, uh, Brad Pfeiffer with Hampton Lumber. There's somebody named Pam, if you want to introduce yourself. I'll give everybody a chance and remember to go back on mute when you're finished introducing. Um, somebody named Ray's iPhone. Uh, Ray Jones, Stenson Lumber. Welcome, Ray. And then Dave Ivanoff Hampton. Uh, this is Dave Ivanoff with Hampton. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Uh, Ian Ferguson. Ian Ferguson, Northwest Steelheaders. Welcome, Jim Muck. Hi, this is Jim Muck from NOAA Fisheries. I'm out of Roseburg, Oregon with the Oregon Coast Branch. Welcome. Unfortunately, my list keeps rearranging as I'm going through the introduction, so I'm sorry if I call on you twice. Um, there's a, a Joe, and the name just moved. Here you are, Kirkfleet. Yeah, Flint. Joe Kirkfleet, Joe Kirkfleet with uh, Blueback Chapter of Child Unlimited. Welcome, thank you for being here. Um, who else, Julie Furman? This is Julie Furman from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Welcome, Kathleen Sullivan. Hi, this is Kathleen Sullivan, uh, Clatsop County Commissioner. Thank Welcome. Okay, whoever that was, welcome. Was that Leanne Thompson? Sorry. I know. It is Leanne Thompson, Thompson County Commissioner, District 5. It turns out that if someone is on my contact, my emergency contact list, it uh, overrides do not disturb. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's happened to me. So we understand and welcome. Thank you for being here with us. So um, 
people are going to have to help me if I'm calling on you twice. I apologize. The list is moving. Ralph Saperstein. This is Ralph Saperstein representing Boise Cascade. Okay. Welcome. Uh, Seth Barnes. Seth Barnes with the Oregon Forest Industries Council. Okay. And then I'm just going to try to find... Sylvia, you can help me if I'm missing them. Carla Cole. Carla Cole, Lewis and Clark National Historical Park. Welcome. Chris Barr. Chris hey, Conrad. Our, I'm sorry, Chris, Chris for our uh, Clatsop Soil and Water Conservation District. Okay. Welcome, Chris. Um, I may have to at some point, if, so Sylvia, I'm having a little trouble because when people join, the list keeps moving. And I'm going to try to find a few sure. more. This is an awesome list, and I hope you can all see it on the left or right wherever you open up your screen. How about Cindy Roberts? Hi, Cindy Robert, Hancock Forest Management. Okay, thank you for being here. Helena Lino. Hi, good afternoon. This is Helena Linnell with the Coquille Indian Tribe. Awesome. Thank you for being with us. And Mike Clausey. Good afternoon, everyone. Mike Clausey, Oregon Forest Resources Institute. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Rich Lump. Hi, it's uh, Rich Lump, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you, Ryan Singleton. Yeah, Ryan Singleton, Department of State Lands. Rod Kramer. Yes, Rod Kramer, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Ralph Saperstein. This is still Ralph Saperstein representing the Boise Cascade. <laughs> See, I did think I'd called on you already. Good job for recognizing that. How about Paul Henson? Yeah, this is Paul Henson, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Right, great to have you. Thank you. How about Paul Lulay? Paul Lulay, Hampton Lumber. Okay, I'm going to try a few more here. Nancy Ferber, did I call on you? No, not yet. I'm Nancy Ferber. I'm with the Columbia River Estuary Study Task Force. All right. Great to have you with us. And Nadia Gardner. I think it's an interested public. So Nadia, thank you for being here. I'm going to try a couple more. Mike Buffo. Hi, Mike Buffo, Washington Department of Natural Resources. Hey, Mark Rasmussen. Hi, this is Mark. I'm with Mason, Bruce, and Gerard. Okay, great. Uh, Sylvia, can you help me first? Back, I feel like I should let yeah. it get going. It's a really awesome well, list, and yeah, we have a few folks with their hands up, so I'll just go Cindy, and then Daniel Stark, and then someone that's TMS Bond. Thank you, Sylvia. This is Cindy Kolomaychuk with ODF. And Sylvia, I think because you're labeled the host, I do not see you as an option to chat with you. So perhaps we assign that to Michelle because I do see her name. Good idea. Thank you for that, Cindy. Okay. And, All right. And Daniel, Daniel Stark, go ahead. Excuse me. Hi, everyone. I just want to introduce myself. This is Dan Stark. I'm from Oregon State Extension Forestry and Natural Resources, and um, I serve Clats up Tillamook and Lincoln Counties. Thank you. Welcome. And TMF 505 Bond. Do you want to introduce yeah, yourself? That's me, Bond Starker, Starker Forest. And Dan Edge? Hi. Uh, yeah, this is Dan Edge from Oregon State University. Just wanted to introduce myself. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So I think for purposes of time, I just want to say this is an amazing list of participants, well-rounded, well-represented, and we can't thank you enough for being here. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, if I live, and if I could please hand it over to you for an official welcome from the agency. Yeah, great. Thank you, Deb. And thank you, everyone, for being here or joining us today. Hopefully, the audio is working. So I'll carry on as though it is. We hear uh, you, go forth. Okay, great. So
so yeah, really appreciate everyone's willingness uh, to invest your thinking and energy at a time when your attentions are most certainly being pulled in multiple directions. So uh, I thank you and the agency thanks you. Um, our whole team really appreciates you being here. These are obviously unprecedented circumstances with COVID-19. Um, our agency is engaged at multiple levels with the issue, um, in part as an emergency response organization. Um, so uh, we're dialed in um, in this uh, emergency in, in many different ways. Um, we are adjusting how we do business with the direction for social distancing. So as you can tell, we're holding this meeting today as a Zoom slash webinar. Uh, meeting and then uh, we have our employees all working remotely um, to ensure safety and wellness. Um, along those same lines, the Board of Forestry meeting that's being held on uh, April 22nd is also going to be a remote meeting. Uh, more information to come out on that if you all are accustomed to attending those meetings. Um, we are committed to keeping the public engagement process um, a meaningful one and so uh, pr again appreciate everyone kind of bearing with us while we try out this format it's a lot of really important work to be done not only by our division but the agency as a whole on policy work with the board and public engagement is just really critical to that um, so here we are in sort of the <laughs> sort of some uncharted territory in uh, assuring that that's still a part of our public process so again, thank you very much for being here. Um, so the purpose of today is to share the recent developments in, the, in our pursuit of a habitat conservation plan for our state forest lands that are west of the um, Cascades, our Western Oregon Habitat Conservation Plan. As uh, some of you may be aware, we've also been working in a parallel path on a draft uh, forest management plan for the same spatial scale there uh, west of the Cascades. Um, if we were to move forward with that plan, it would be implemented without an HCP. We've completed a draft of that plan and it is now, uh, it's going to be on the consent agenda for the April Board of Forestry meeting. And what that does is simply put the draft plan and some accompanying materials on the record uh, for the board and for the public and we're just, that's simply the goal, just to put it on the record for discussion at a future point. A lot of really great work went into that. Um, and because the board meeting has been um, reduced in time and because it's a webinar format, we decided to hold off on an in-depth discussion about that work and instead put it on the consent agenda. So wanted to make folks aware of that. So we've been working in parallel on the FMP and the HCP, and this year it all comes together. Um, and so that's an important part of um, how things are gonna play out this year. So those really come together in October of this year, where we'll go to the board and we'll be asking the board if they want us to continue move, moving forward on the HCP. We'll move into and begin adapting this draft forest management plan to function as a companion to the HCP. Um, so that's kind of the big milestone. I'll get to that a little bit here more in a minute. So with that set aside, a little background for today. This is an exciting moment in time for forestry in Oregon uh, with multiple HCP efforts underway. And so it can be a little confusing. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to clarify uh, what's going on. So we manage, the Department of Forestry manages Board of Forestry, State Forest Lands and Oregon. And hey Liz, so, so if there are people that are not on mute, everybody has hey, to Mary, stay on mute. Hey Mary, good luck, to you. There you go. Sylvia, this is Cindy Colomacha. If you control mute, we cannot hear you. I'm gonna keep moving. Okay. We're good? Okay. 
So today we're here to talk about the Board of Forestry, HCP. There are a lot of other, there are several other efforts going on. And so just as a reminder, these are lands that are um, managed by Department of Forestry under ownership. They're state forest lands managed by the Board of Forestry. So for the acres that we're covering west of the Cascades, it's about 600,000 acres. We manage these lands to provide for greatest permanent value uh, to the people of Oregon, which asks us to strike a balance between social, economic, and environmental benefits over time and across the landscape. By statute, revenue that's generated from the management of these lands is shared with the counties within which we manage those lands. So the counties have a unique and special relationship both with how the lands are managed and with the agency. An HCP is extremely advantageous for managing these Board of Forestry lands. There are a number of benefits that flow uh, to the counties and to Oregonians. And there are just really high expectations on all fronts in terms of the protection of fish and wildlife, active management, recreation. So we can, if we're successful, we feel we can best provide those services to the public if there's certainty um, around how we can manage these forests in compliance with the Endangered Species Act. So an HCP has the potential to provide an increase in conservation for the threatened endangered species and at the same time provide ODF with the operational certainty to manage out in, into the future. So as I mentioned in the outset, we uh, feel there will we'll have greater likelihood of success if we have a meaningful engagement with our county commissioners um, and the public. So again, it's really important and we appreciate you all being here today. So that's what we're talking about today, but there are a few other um, efforts underway in the state. Um, and it's important to note, those are for lands that are under different ownership and they're being managed to comply with different legal mandates and to achieve different goals. Um, so those include an effort to get an HCP on the Elliott State Forest, the Elliott is owned by the Department of State Lands and is managed under legal mandates associated with revenue to the Common School Fund. Right now, the HCP is being written for the Elliott in thinking about it as a research forest that could eventually be owned by Oregon State University. So different owner, different legal mandate, and different management goal different group of people working on that. We are collaborating and, and coordinating to make sure we understand what each other are doing. There's another much larger effort that's been initiated through a memorandum of agreement between uh, private landowners and conservation groups to work collaboratively towards an HCP that would provide coverage for private lands. That is um, some neat work that came together um, towards the end of um, the short session here and there's some leadership here um, in this meeting that have been part and parcel of making that happen. Really exciting time there. Again, the State Forest Division and group we're working on our HCP here today um, is, is not uh, providing the leadership on that effort. And then there's an effort underway by a private company called Port Blakely um, also working on an HCP, again, leading their own effort, have their own coordination, collaboration with the services to assure that um, compliance with the ESA. So the best possible outcome in my perspective is if all of these were to be successful in the state of Oregon, we would see both an uplift in conservation as well as operational certainty over such a large uh, percentage of the forest lands in Oregon. So it really is an um, exciting moment in time. I'll just say a few more words and then I'll turn it back over. Um, so again, today we're here to discuss the Western Oregon um, State Forest Habitat Conservation Plan for our Board of Forestry Lands. This was uh, always set up as a three-phased approach and uh, the first phase uh, really kicked into gear in April of 2018 when we received some grant funds to begin our work. Um, and the intent of phase one was to conduct a business case that could help the Board of Forestry decide if they thought it was in the best interest of the state of Oregon to pursue an HCP. And so we went to them with that business case in November of 2018, and indeed they did um, direct us to continue our work and move into phase two. And so we're in phase two right now, and our task here is to draft a habitat conservation plan, an administrative draft of a habitat conservation plan. 
And uh, that's the update you're going to be getting here today. Uh, the, that would come together in October, at which time we'd be asking the board if they want us to go into phase three. And phase three would direct us to move into the NEPA process. Um, so that's a really big milestone. J July, at the Board of Forestry meeting in July, we'll be, be providing an update again on the Habitat Conservation Plan. And then um, that would set the stage for us to move into the October meeting. In order for the board to make that decision in October, we're going to be providing them with an, a very, with a comparative analysis so that they can sort of weigh out the pros and cons of moving forward and managing these lands with an HCP or without an HCP. And if they determined indeed move forward with an HCP, we would bring that draft force management plan that has been on the side burner since this April board meeting back into the fold and begin to adapt it to be a companion FMP. If the board were to say, no, we no longer want you to pursue an HCP, we would regroup and come back in January of 2021 with a proposed work plan on how they want us to move forward looking at appropriate overarching policies uh, for managing these state forests to achieve greatest permanent value. So those were the comments I was going to make this fine afternoon and I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you. I voice to the best of my ability. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to take it off mute because it was such a horrible noise. Um, I'm going to try again and finish. I literally just took it off mute, so I'm hoping nothing else will happen. Um, I'm good. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm not sure why that happened. So again, this is Deb Noodleman, Kearns and West. I'm just going to take a minute on your screen if you're looking at it or if you have the PowerPoint slides in front of you are the agenda topics. I'm just going to name the topic, give you a few bits of formatting for um, how we want to handle this part of the meeting, and then we'll jump right in. So um, as soon as I finish this piece, we have some updates on the Western Forest HCP. So we always like to take a few minutes on the where you've been, where you're at, and where you're going from a substantive perspective. So just as a reminder of the place where we're at, and I give you some updates. Next, we'll be spending some time on the forest goals and objectives. Following that, policy level timber, timber harvest modeling, and then two pieces on the HCP update itself. One has to do with the terrestrial conservation strategy, and the second has to do with the aquatic conservation strategy. Each of those topics has opportunity for presentation, and we are going to ask that you hold your questions during the presentation to really help get all that information out first. And then if you're forming clarity, a little bit of back and forth thing. And as importantly, we just want to mention the fact that in this meeting format, for those of you that have attended before, you know about this. If you haven't, here's how it works. The formal meeting that's open to the public right now is from one till three. It includes presentations, clarifying questions, and a little bit of discussion on each of these big topics. And then we have another hour after we finish the summary and next steps where it says number seven, additional discussion time. And that's from 3 to 4 p.m. And the way we'd like to handle this is as we're going through each of these topics, we know we're going to run out of time and we're not going to have a chance to do a deeper dive. So the additional discussion time allows for that opportunity for more discussion on specific topics, the potential for you to help engage a little more deeply on topics that are of interest to you. And we're going to save that hour at the end. And Sylvia is going to be listening and keeping a running list of the potential topics for discussion in that 3 to 4 p.m. time frame. If you'd only prefer to stay from 1 till 3, that's totally fine. If you have an interest in staying from 3 to 4, we'd love to have you join for that piece. 
And again, if you'd ever been in the room when that happened at these other open to the public meetings, it was even informal. You could kind of walk around, talk to different people. Here, we're going to have to keep it a little more structured on this virtual meeting format. But we're really excited about having this full time frame to engage with you. Um, the last opportunity is that if for whatever reason you don't want to verbally participate during this meeting, please note that you can also submit um, comments through email to Jason Cox. And his email address is somewhere here, but it's jason.r.cox. Oh, Sylvia showed it. That's right. There it is, right, at the remote participation at Oregon.gov. Thanks so much for that. And we'd be glad to have you please feel free to submit any other comments by email directly to Jason on behalf of the process. So I think that's it. And Troy, I think we're just ready to jump right in. I'm going to go on mute now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Deb. Um, hi, everyone. This is Troy Ramick with ICF, and um, I am the project manager for the, the Habitat Conservation Planning Team. Uh, all of the technical work that goes into the development of the HCP, and you're going to hear about quite a bit of that today. Uh, I'm going to start with just a, a program update, uh, and I'm going to keep this relatively brief because we are most of what I'm going to tell you in the update, we're going to actually go deeper on that um, in, the, in the next hour or so. Um, but I understand also that um, for some of you, this might be the first time that you are um, interacting with the process or, or becoming aware of the process. So uh, just a couple of key features of the HCP that I think are important um, for everyone's understanding. So first of all, um, where does the HCP apply? So we mentioned that this is a habitat conservation plan. Um, it is going to support uh, permit applications under the Endangered Species Act to both the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and um, National Marine Fisheries Service. And therefore, it, that, those permits will apply to a specific geographical area. And um, that area is uh, referred to as the permit area uh, in the sort of lexicon of habitat conservation planning work. And the permit area is going to cover all of uh, Oregon Department of Forestry managed lands. I'll show you a, a picture of what that looks like in a second. Uh, that includes uh, all uh, Board of Forestry lands, uh, as Liz mentioned at the top. It also includes some common school lands, not all, and I'll explain why when I show you the, the picture. Um, it also contemplates places where uh, land, uh, land ownership might change in the future. So there could be land transfers, as you know, there could be land acquisitions uh, by the state. And so we, we know that land ownership is, is mostly static, but not completely static over time. And we're talking about uh, a permit term of potentially uh, around 70 years. So a lot can have happen in 70 years. So we have to also think about the potential uh, need to cover lands that are not currently under state ownership. Uh, as a result, we have created uh, what we are calling the plan area. And I know this is hard to see on your screen, so my apologies. But this is basically um, the permit area of our habitat conservation plan. And everything you see in blue here is um, Oregon Department of Forestry managed lands. And then it's a little hard to see, but there are some little pink patches um, scattered throughout. Those are uh, common school lands, uh, common school lands that are of course owned by Department of State lands, but currently managed by uh, um, Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, notably, you'll see, as, as Liz mentioned, the other HCP efforts going on in the state. One is with the Elliott uh, State Forest, and um, this is where the Elliott State Forest is. The common school lands that are uh, within the Elliott State Forest are not shown on this map because they are not covered by this HCP. They would be covered by uh, Department of State lands HCP that is underway. So that's the, the one nuance to, to the overall scheme. Uh, and that basically uh, shows you the, the permit area and the plan area. Now, in some cases, it's a little easier to see where you have more of a checkerboard um, or Oregon Department of Forestry ownership. This is the places where you might expect in the future some um, land transfers to occur. And so we have included that plan area, the purple line. Again, I apologize for the scale, but the purple line around some of those areas uh, to accommodate potential land transfers in the future. So um, that's, the, that's the difference between the permit area, which is mostly the blue, and the plan area, which is the little thin line, the purple line, that you see around the permit area. So that's where the permits would apply. And then the other important thing to remember is that um, we are getting from those two federal agencies, and they are for specific species, and this is the list of species here. Um, 16 uh, total, um, nine of those species are fish, which you can see. I won't read them, but you can see them. 
uh, and then three salamander species, the spotted owl, the marble murrelet, red tree vole, and coastal martin. Um, for folks, uh, I'll, I'll be better about this going forward, but for folks that are maybe just following along on the, par on the, uh, the presentation that we sent in now, so sorry about that. Um, one important thing to note here, and you'll see it in the foot, is that most of the species that we're covering are currently listed under the Endangered Species Act, but not all of them. We do have the ability to cover species that we think are going to become listed during the permit term. And we're doing that with a few like red tree vole and coastal martin and this as examples. So um, those species are not currently listed, but we expect that they will be um, yeah, sometime in the future. So what have we been up to uh, lately? Um, you're gonna hear a lot about this next or in, in the coming um, hour or so, but um, just to give you a little bit of a primer of that. Um, as before, I've been working with um, the scoping team on the sort of the technical elements of the habitat conservation plan. Uh, as, you, as you may recall, the scoping team is a group of uh, technical staff from uh, both the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and National Marine Fisheries Service and then several other state agencies working together to develop the strategies that, um, that we're including in the, in the HCP and, and several members of the scoping team are on the call today uh, as well, I saw. Uh, by and large, over the last couple of months, we have been focusing on developing the conservation strategies and sort of building the kind of um, basic framework of those strategies, which I'm gonna talk about today. And um, an important step in that process, at least on the terrestrial side, has been thinking through things like data availability, uh, habitat modeling, uh, which I'll touch on today, and then you know where do we think uh, the conservation focus should be in this habitat conservation plan, and then similarly on the aquatic side, development of the aquatic conservation strategy, which is um, you know sort of a threefold strategy, which I'll get into later today, uh, and importantly, uh, uh, probably most importantly, and what we'll spend the most time on today are um, the strategy uh, around riparian buffering uh, that will be involved. Um, we're beginning to discuss um, habitat enhancement activities. So the, the previous two bullets I would kind of say are like, where are we going to do conservation actions? And then uh, this fourth bullet is more like, what are we going to do uh, in those places? And we have only begun those discussions at the scoping team level. And so I'll touch on that today. Certainly more to discuss about that in the future. Um, and I just wanted to point out uh, both in terms of, I think just a, a general acknowledgement of the commitment to the process, but also um, so that you all understand the sort of um, the volume and level of, of work that is occurring right now. The scoping team has now increased their meetings from once a month to twice a month. Um, those meetings are generally about four hours long each. So as a, as a big commitment of time um, from those folks and we really appreciate the help that they've given us. We do continue to meet with the steering committee, which is a management level within the, the federal agencies and, and those same state agencies. Um, this it meets about once a month and gets briefed on the, the workings of the scoping team and the process that or the, the progress that is being made to date. Um, here's a pretty high level overview of, of the schedule and Liz touched on some of this, so I won't spend a lot of time, but we're sitting here today um, meeting up with the public. Uh, we're gonna continue, you'll hear kind of a, a framing of the, the conservation strategies and kind of where they stand as of today. And then we're gonna continue to work on those strategies over the next couple of months. Um, both uh, on the, the kind of conservation, but also on the policy level timber harvest modeling, which you're going to hear, hear a little bit about next. Um, as we get into the late spring and early summer, that'll be more sort of the, I described the strategy refinement stage. So we'll have worked a lot of that information through with the scoping team. Um, you'll be hearing about some of that and then um, refining those strategies and kind of tightening it up into what will become uh, that first administrative draft of the HCP that Liz mentioned. Um, that would then be in front of the Board of Forestry in October, uh, as we noted. Um, and then should the Board of Forestry decide uh, they want to forward with the planning process, um, there would still be more to come after that, and I've sort of listed it out in, in one very broad here. Um, but we um, move into a NEPA process and, and the development of the FMP, which would play out over the course of um, basically uh, 2021 and, and go into 2020 a little bit. So still quite a bit in front of us, but I think we have made uh, significant progress in the last couple of months since we saw you last. You're, you're gonna hear about that um, in the coming slides. 
So with that, um, Deb, you may want to take um, a couple of questions here before we go on to uh, timber harvest modeling and Brian. And before Deb starts, this is Sylvia again with Trends and West. I just want to say we're trying to manage this queue, and so we have everybody on mute now. So if you do have, if you raise your hand, that's the best way for us to find out if you want to speak. And it may take me a second to put you off mute. So just be be patient. We're um, so just know that there may be a bit of a lag, but we'll get you off mute when we can to reduce feedback. Thanks. What about me, Sylvia? Do I have to? Can you hear me? Yeah. You can? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. I don't have to raise my hand. I'm just trying to check. Um, so I'm trying to see, I don't see actually any hands raised, Troy. And we can check, I guess, if there's somebody that, um, wish they could speak they could try to go off mute or oh, it sounds like sylvia you're managing it um okay yeah, i'm just gonna probably... okay i'm just gonna give it one more look are we okay to keep going okay good thank you so much so troy i think once you go ahead on to your next topic okay and with that i think i'll turn it over to brian Pugh, who will talk about what was goals and objectives and um, the policy level timber harvest modeling. And Brian, I can advance slides for you on your queue. Great. Thanks, Troy. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here and uh, working through this with us. And Troy, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? I can hear you fine, yep. Okay, perfect. So it looks like technology is working. I'm going to be talking about the four goals and objectives, and Troy is going to advance to our second slide here, and we'll get on with it. And these are really important. Um, they're conceptual goals and objectives that are part of the companion force management plan. And so they are not actually written into the HCP document itself, and they're not part of the federal process. But I think everybody can on the phone can understand how important they would be because really they are setting the goals and objectives for how the forest would be managed outside the conservation commitments that are, would be in place in the habitat conservation plan. And so this was a draft document and draft concepts that were developed by the foresters at ODF and reviewed by some external folks um, focused on the forestry. And they would be coming to the Board of Forestry in the form of the Companion Forest Management Plan. That plan would be uh, drafted in the fall if the HCP goes into the NEPA process. And so we're definitely forward thinking about this and have been working on this about six or eight months. The reason they're so important right now, and I think everybody can understand this, is because they really complement the habitat conservation commitments. And they will kind of balance um, the forest and are important in the modeling, uh, the timber harvest modeling that I'll be talking about next. And so knowing what is to occur outside the conservation commitments are an important part of it. And so early on, we wanted to set some high level goals. For those of you that have been following along, and I know I'm looking through the list um, of participants here, many have, they're in the same format as the conservation goals and objectives. So using that same format and those same principles as high level goals, and then objectives that we want to achieve over that 70 year time period. And again, I mentioned that, you know, this is a working draft that would come to the board um, probably sometime next year. And I know early on when we were doing introductions and, and trying to manage the queue there, there were some board members that were viewing this, um, and I'm not sure if they're still on here or not, but I also know this will be posted, this uh, whole video meeting will be posted to our website. And so if people aren't viewing it now, like board members, they'll be viewing it later. And so why we're, a ways out from taking it to them. I know they're actively, board members are actively uh, paying attention to the whole process in these forest goals. So following along um, with our standard business practices of really honoring greatest permanent value and speaking to the social, environmental, and economic 
benefits of the forest and having that always in mind when we're managing the forest, these goals are set up in that way. And so the next slide will be the social goals and I will, oh, great. I got one before there's definitions. I will walk through there. One comment on the definitions that I mentioned a minute ago that I know a lot of people are following along with the conservation goals and here we've got the forest goals. We're using the same words and the reason we thought the project team thought it was important to put the definitions up is to highlight that they're slightly different. Um, because in the conservation goals, they speak more to the species and to the habitat of the species. These goals are a little bit broader. Um, so if you're reading them, just know that the, the definitions are more holistic in the sense of forest management and forest wide. And we really struggled and tried not to do that. But the, at the end of the day, we realized we had to fine tune the definitions. Um, so that's why we've got them up there. I'm going. agony of reading uh, all the slides here. <laughs> so somebody has a problem with that, then we'll raise our hand and we can get to it. But just real quickly, if you look at that, um, the definitions there, the active management on maintain, um, to protect from harm, on conserve, implement, increase is uh, and improve is enhance and restore is uh, assisting in the recovery of a resource that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. So again, just at a high level, these next few slides, I'm going to hit the high points. Um, and if you don't have the presentation, we can get it to you afterwards. Okay, so the social goals, I will read the goal because it is the most important. And the goal number one under social is support local and statewide Oregon economies and community well-being. And so that's a lofty goal as they all are. Um, and getting into the objectives, it is about fostering a full range of employment opportunities uh, in forest management, recreation, and other activities, knowing that the forest produces a lot of jobs and we wanna to continue to produce those jobs and, and those livelihoods over the term of the permit, which is we're looking out 70 years and the other activities is, you know, a kind of a catch-all, if you will, because we know our business lines continue to expand and we're continuing to look for other sources of revenue. Objective two is a wide range of public use. Um, we know the public uses our forest a lot. We want to encourage that. We want to connect people to nature. We want to continue for that to happen over the life of the, the permit term. Going down to objective number three, it's provided diversity of for, forest recreation, education, and interpretive opportunities. You know, when we talk about um, broader recreational opportunities and education opportunities, we know we are not uh, uh, Oregon Parks and Rec, and we're not trying to be that. We have a unique niche, um, if you will, that we can provide services on the forest and recreational opportunities that other public lands um, or other places can't and we want to continue to do that and then objective four um, and i should point out that these are not listed in priority order um, that's a really important point that they're put up there just all inclusive and not in priority order um, but Objective four is supporting the ecosystem services, including clean air, clean water, and net carbon sequestration and live trees. And so we know we got a lot of benefits um, from the forest. Some are monetary, <coughs> excuse me. Some are monetized and some are not, but a healthy environment is a really important thing that the forest uh, provides. So with that, that's a good way to transition into the next slide, which is the environmental piece of it. There is eight um, objectives here and the one, and they support the main goal. Um, so goal two under the environment is maintain, enhance or restore the health of Western Oregon State Forest, thereby promoting sustainable, productive and resilient forest ecosystems. We think about that goal, there is a lot there and it's over a long time period. And that's really important to remember when we're thinking, you know, today, tomorrow, 50, 70 years out. 
um, about the productivity and the resilience of the ecosystem in a changing climate. And so to address that goal or to try to work to achieve that goal, we set um, several objectives. Uh, there's eight on this one. On the first one, it speaks to managing for a healthy and sustainable forest and the uncertainty of global climate change. And objective two, it really is trying to get at the net carbon sequestration in live trees over the life of the, uh, the forest plan or the permit term, if you're thinking in HCP terms today. Objective three really is um, thinking about that healthy forest over the long term. And when we think about healthy forests, we want to minimize negative impacts of uh, insects and disease, fire, extreme weather events, and other environmental factors um, by increasing the resiliency across the landscape. Objective four is biological diversity of native vegetation across the landscape. And again, thinking about the 650,000 acres west of the Cascades from Astoria all the way down to the California border, we have a lot of diversity uh, on the geography and we want to maintain that. Dropping down to five, um, structural complexity, tree size, diversity at the stand level, and then at across the landscape. And so we know we are not going to achieve that um, diversity in every stand but we want to achieve it definitely across the landscape and where possible at the stand level. So it's a combination of both kind of micro scale and macro scale in this planning effort. Objective six um, really speaks to the long-term productivity of soil and we know how important that is. Um, we've learned that every day when we think about the Tillamook burn and the damage to the soil there. And so we know that's an important factor having long-term success in management of these forests. Along with uh, object objective seven, which is um, restore native wildlife habitats. And again, that is, of course, an element of the HCP development and the species, the 15 species that we're working towards, but it's also more broader for the other species um, of wildlife that are users of the forest, um, from big game to songbirds and everything in between. Number eight um, definitely speaks to the properly functioning aquatic systems and recognizing that we have to enhance or conserve those um, to make them healthy over the long term. So that's the environmental piece, and I'd say by far the most objectives. And with that, we'll take, uh, turn the slide to the last one, which is the economics. So on the economics, um, the main, the goal for the economics, the one goal is ensure sustainable and predictable revenue across the Western Oregon forest permit over the term of the permit. And so across the area over the whole um, permit term. Looking through these again, number one speaks to the state forest financial viability and we know the financial viability of the division is um, paramount to be able to implement the plan and manage oregon state forest we also know when we look at um, objective two that we want to maintain or enhance revenues to counties local taxing districts and the common school fund recognizing the relationship there and the importance of those monies going into local communities and uh, key public services. Objective three, um, diversity of revenue. And again, always we've been working on this for years and we'll continue to work on it, looking for more ways to bring in revenue, uh, diversify our business lines, if you will, around recreation, carbon sequestration, communication sites or special uh, permits. Then we get down to objective four, maintain or enhance the ability of revenue producing for special forest products. You know, that's a key um, part of our business right now and really helps a lot of people um, having those permits. It, they're running small businesses off of those. I'd say when you think about um, objective two and three together, it really says the forest is managed as a working forest. 
recognizing there's many benefits to species and conservation, um, but we're open for business and ideas so we can be able to afford to provide the full range of benefits on the greatest permanent value. And then the long, the last one is really looking to the long term and really saying, um, and this is one of the main objectives of the HCP in general, to have that stability to be able to produce forest products through the long term, and we produce those forest products through harvesting timber. And so that is the forest goals. And again, um, the goals are at the high level. The objectives are how we're gonna meet them and really recognizing that we will bring more detail as we um, flesh things out with the board through the development of a companion companion to the HCP uh, forest management plan. Thank you so much, Brian. <clears throat> I just want to check. This is Deb Needleman, Curbs and West, to see if we have any questions, any clarifying questions to Brian or ODF at this point about the four goals and objectives. Sylvia, help me, but I don't see hands raised. So I think I'm going to keep going. I think, Troy, you've got another piece to help finish up with this other timber modeling. Yep, Brian has one, uh, and one more set of slides, yep. And, oh, I'm sorry, there yeah. is one hand up now from Leanne okay. Thompson. Hi, Leanne. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested in this diversity of revenue generation. It, that's important. I wonder if you're um, partnering with Business Oregon in order to investigate those possibilities on an actual rather than a theoretical basis. Yeah, Leanne, this is Brian. I'll answer that question. And so um, we are always looking and working with other um, businesses and entities to try to find opportunities that fit within our current management plan and the current structure of greatness permanent value. So right now, I'd say all our policy work and our business improvement work is focused on the, revising the forest management plan and developing the HCP, the habitat conservation plan. All our resources are, you know, over, over, uh, allocated onto that. So we are not looking for those other opportunities. So we're not quite, we are not at this time working with Business Oregon, but definitely um, always try to keep those conversations open. And in the development of the HCP and, and the companion forest management plan, really having it structured so when those opportunities arrive over the next decade or, or longer, that they fit into our structure. And so thank you for that question. Thanks for asking, Liam. Anybody else questions? Connie, more? If you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. Connie, are you off mute, though, before you ask your question? There you go. Okay. Um, so moving forward, um, I, you know, since what, of course, is most stable or incremental, uh, changes in our government as time goes on. Um, when this is all finished, will there still be opportunities to change things? One of the one of the key pieces that I really am bothered by is the fact that the schools and the local communities have to in, depend on timber revenues for some of their funding. And I think we need to get away from that. I don't know that that can happen in the short term. Are there things that can be done through the legislature to change the, this kind of funding goal? Yeah, Connie, that's a real thoughtful question. And, and um, it's an important one for the public to debate over the next um, however many years. And I know we'll be talking a lot about funding and taxes, I think, um, soon with all the things that are going on in our world. As far as the development of the HCP and the, and the management of the forest, um, under greatest term of value, it is set up to generate revenue that go to local uh, 
communities, counties, and communities and local taxing districts. And so in this structure that is honored and will happen as to exactly what local taxing districts and what you know community uh, entities that goes through whether it's schools or police or um, transportation or county government in general that is a uh, debate for the legislature as you characterized it and can occur and would not change um, dramatically the way the forest is managed or the way the habitat conservation plan is implemented. So after the plan is implemented, the legislature, so if we wanted to fund schools and local communities in a different way, other than timber harvest, um, you're saying that once the plan's in place, the legislature can't uh, alter that? No, I'm sorry. It, it, I know it's hard um, not being in the same room with you, and, and I wish we were, but no, I'm saying that they do have the authority and they can alter and it, all, the legislature can change the funding after an HCP would be developed and approved. And so they still and always will have that authority and they could okay. Okay. do that. Okay, that that uh, that gives me more hope. Uh, I I just uh, I guess if if it hasn't become clear, I do not see timber harvesting as a sustainable way to support our communities. No, I definitely hear you there. And one thing that comes to mind, um, and I think for everybody on the phone can understand that when we think about 70 years and managing a forest, as a forester, I think I know I can plant a tree and I can have some idea of what that tree is going to look like in 70 years. Um, but as a government, uh, you know, the deputy of the state forest division, I don't know the business and the political changes that are going to happen and I don't pretend to be able to predict those and so when we sat and down as a team and the scoping team with lots of input from many smart folks and thought about the 70 year life of the permit term we really did broad goals and as you saw I walked through three goals um, and they're really broad and it's trying to have the breadth and depth and flexibility over seven years to be able to accommodate changes from the legislature or from the public or from local government and and uh, still be able to be successful and sustainable. Okay, that, thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Yeah, so thank you, Connie, for speaking up. So, um, so I think for purposes of time, Brian, I'm gonna move us along. I think you have a little more to do here in this section. I do. I'm going to talk Troy. about the timber Go harvesting ahead. model. Yep. Yep. Okay. And so I'll get Troy to click ahead on the slide and, and a little look um, behind the screen on how we're doing our modeling. And this will set Troy up for some later talks too. But really on our timber harvesting modeling, at this level, we're using the term, um, it's really to support decision making and be informed the Board of Forestry and ODF leadership as to the outcomes of the possibilities. Um, so it's high level modeling and it is being done through ICF and it's winter program approach to maximize net present value. And so it is a hundred year time horizon that we're modeling. And really we've been talking about a 70 year permit term and, and that is true, but really running the modeling out past that uh, 70 years and seeing um, what the force would look like even past the HCP. So getting your head around that, that we're modeling out a hundred years. And of course with any modeling, um, the further out you go, the more variability there is with it. And then we're breaking that modeling, those results down into five-year time periods. And that's important as we look at the stand structure on the landscape and the benefits to uh, conservation. 
And so when we think about this modeling, it is enough for analysis of the strategies, the conservation strategies. It is a test run of the forest goals to see how they play out on the landscape and really kind of accentuates the trade-offs between, you know, timber harvest on the forest versus conservation value and looking at the forest in a very holistic way. Another couple of key points here on the modeling is it is across that whole landscape. And so the whole 638,000 acres are modeled at one and that's more to the holistic view. Those of you, there's many of you on the call that really know our process as well. And you know that we break modeling down into smaller planning segments and those smaller segments being the implementation plans. Those are 10 year plans um that we currently have this modeling is not at that level it's at the rolled up the whole landscape um, level of that so more modeling would be done if we move into the NEPA process for now again i think just keep in mind we're calling it policy level timber harvesting model to inform decision makers the next level down is in our vernacular and our speak would be operational or implementation plan levels that would come uh, a year from now or so. And uh, another factor too, just to give you a little insight of what we're doing, there are about 13,000, close to 14,000 units, if you will, in the model. And they're broken down by characteristics like the stand vegetation, whether they're riparian zones, whether they're operator, operable or not, and what kind of harvest can occur on them. So a big combination of things um, in those models at the landscape and those parameters, we can track not only the economics of it, but the ecological parameters over time. And that's what really is gonna inform us around the HCP, but seeing both the economics of it and the conservation uh, play out on the landscape. And important key elements that we're looking at is the stand structure, um, the initiation ages, the stories, and a wide range of characteristics, including you know stand diameters and tree heights, um, and the ability to sequester carbon. So those are the little look behind the scenes. There, I will say that. We have been, it has been requested by the project team um, for a technical meeting on the modeling. And so we are setting that up for April. And really that request has come from a couple different people, but the experts and the experts want to get in the room um, and understand this more. And so if there's interest there, you can reach out. Um, I'd say send Jason an email. His email has been up quite a bit during this meeting, but recognizing that it's a real technical meeting um, and gets there really quickly. I'd say in regards to the habitat conservation plan, it does have, it will have the constraints of the conservation areas of those requirements and both the spatial dynamics and spatial by saying like the riparian buffers as an example, and the temporal, the dynamics and the kind of the stand structure over time. We really do want to understand how that habitat improves for the species over time. And so those components will be in there. And then my last thought as I kind of close it out um, is on the metrics. And we will be looking at a range of things again. And you can see on your screen from timber volume and revenue, operating costs, um, but also the forest inventory. And that piece is key to what Troy's going to talk about next because it does talk directly to that forest inventory in those five year increments shows the quality of the habitat through time. And Troy will get into more of that in the next couple of slides. I'm going to pause in a minute before and take some questions. Um, but before I do, just keep in mind, I think the model is an intricate process of forest operations and habitat conservation. And so it's a dynamic and iterative process. We're just beginning the modeling. And so it's going to take several months of a feedback loop between um, the linear programming, the foresters in the field, the wildlife biologists, the whole uh, scoping team looking at that. And so there is 
several feedback loops there that we will adjust the models and adjust the parameters based on um, the development of the conservation strategies and the economic needs um, to be able to achieve the, the goals. So with that, I'm going to pause there and look back to Deb to facilitate some questions. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Really helpful information. So I've got a couple hands up. And we'll take these questions. Craig Patterson, you were up first, and then Dave Eisenhoff afterwards. Yes, thank you. Um, what is the age class percentage of those lands that you speak of? And also, what is the variation in elevation, just out of curiosity? Craig, those are good questions. I don't have all the information right in front of me, and I know um, there is a lot of detail there that we could talk about. And so maybe we could talk uh, offline and follow up on those. And if you can send Jason an email, that'd be the best for that. Um, it is, you know, as far as elevation, if you think from the coast range to the Cascade, huge elevation range. Um, and then if you think north from Astoria all the way down to the California border, a huge geographic range. And when we think about the age class, um, so elevation, a wide range, if you will, um, and I'm not gonna guess at the numbers, but I can get them to you. And then if we think about the age class, we know we have a lot of our forests um, that were replanted after the Tillamook burn, and a lot of people know that story, but we've also got much older forests um, in the North Cascades and other districts that have significantly different age classes. And so it's hard to throw out the age range, um, with, but we can sit down and get you that information. Okay, so thank you on that. And um, I'm gonna have, I have a couple more questions and then I'm gonna have to move us on. We've got a couple more big topics we need to get to. So Dave, you go ahead and then Connie's after you. Got to go off mute, Dave. Okay. Um, am I off mute now? You are. Go yeah, ahead. you sure are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brian, could you help me understand uh, the timing um, of the development of the terrestrial and aquatic strategies and how and when they will be incorporated into the modeling work? You may have covered that, and I might have missed it, but uh, but it seems like those strategies have to be developed before the modeling can actually start. Is that correct, or am I missing something? Yeah, Dave, thanks for the question, and, and I know you've been following this for a long time, so you know exactly what's going on. So in the next couple of slides, Troy's going to be speaking to that. Okay. And um, a, a simple answer would be, Yes, we don't have those fully developed, and so we can't run the modeling yet, but we are through position with the modeling as when they get developed, we'll load those in and, and get going. So I'm gonna let, I won't steal Troy's thunder there. I'll talk to that in a okay, couple thank minutes. You. It was a nice introduction, Dave, so thanks for that. Okay, and then Connie, uh, if you wanna go off mute, you have a question, go ahead. Here. Um, whoops, wait a minute. Uh, you just went back up, you try again. Okay, there we, let's see. Oops, did you unmute me? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so um, one thing is the, you know, there's been a lot of new science on the climate change and um, uh, is, I just want to verify because I know that this has been just a summary on the visual. Um, how uh, are you making climate change an important part of the model? Uh, you know, a, a key part of the model. And where are where are you using for what are you using for your sources of climate science? Yeah, Connie. I'll touch on that and then I'll probably transition it to Troy too. And as far as how we are addressing climate change in the model, we're really looking towards resilience. And so in the 
timber harvest modeling and the stand structure outputs that we're looking at, we are not factoring in climate change because of there's so many unknowns and we couldn't uh, find somebody that's currently doing that. And so the approach we are taking is definitely having a forest that is resilient um, to change and being adaptable. And so that's how we're trying to provide that certainty. I spoke a little earlier about, you know, we know in these models that 10, 20 years, 30 years, um, they produce really good results. And then the further out you go, the more uncertainty there are in, in any model, right? So we're dealing with that here. And we've thought about the complexities of the climate change and trying to build that into the model. There was just too much variability in there. So that was the first question. The second one, a uh, part of your question, which is um, important too, is what are our sources for kind of climate change and helping us think about them and helping them adapt to it and make those strategies? Because it is in a lot of our discussions on the project team and we are looking at that um, in many different aspects. And so I'll let Troy kind of explain outside the modeling how we're um, using that science and incorporate it into the development of the HCP. Okay, thank you. So Brian, I want to thank you. It's a lot of information to have to share and thank you so much for doing it so well. Um, and we're going to move on now. And Troy, we're going to have you take over. And this might have had your hand up because you had more to say, but either way, we're going to hand it over to you now. Go ahead. Thanks, Deb. No, I only had my hand up because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to unmute myself. So thank you. <laughs> Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, thanks, everybody. Again, Troy Ramick with ICF, uh, the project manager for the HCP uh, project team. And what I'm going to do for pretty much the rest of the time here, and I'll, and I'll try to catch us up a little, because I know we're running a little bit behind, is give an, an overview of the terrestrial strategy development, and then after that, an overview of the, the um, aquatic strategy development. Um, hit it at a pretty high level today. Um, we'll have some follow-up conversations about that, I'm sure, but I wanted to let you know kind of um, where we're headed. And then I, I guess one disclaimer as I go into this, is that um, you probably noticed that there are a lot more words on the slides today than there typically would be. Uh, and that's in part because I, with the format, I know that some of you might be uh, revisiting the information after the call, uh, thinking it through a little bit more. And I wanted to make sure that there was enough detail on the slides that made it meaningful. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. And I won't be hitting every word, but, um, but certainly wanted you to have the content as a follow-up if needed. So on the terrestrial strategy, um, the, basically what I'm going to run through are just a, a very quick recap on the biological goals and objectives. We talked about the biological goals and objectives um, for, at our last meeting, a uh, meeting open to the public, so we spent a lot of time on that. I'll talk you through how we're sort of sequencing our, our terrestrial species or how we're thinking about sequencing of terrestrial species as it relates to the conservation strategy. Um, the data that we're using and some information about kind of the variability of data that's available. Um, and then talk a little bit about um, a habitat modeling approach that we're using to fill some gaps in data there. Um, and then um, introduce you to um, kind of conceptually planning on developing um, these habitat conservation areas. So first, like Brian, I wanted to just reconnect you with some of the terminology that we talked about. Um, won't read it, but um, when I show you the biological goals and objectives again in a second, I wanted to remind you of these uh, these terms, which were um, which were used deliberately: um, persist, maintain, conserve, and enhance. Uh, and as you recall, our last conversation, sometimes we're going to do all of these things in the same place, depending on sort of the the condition of the habitat and our, and our, and our objectives for that particular part of the forest. Um, but, but those terms are used purposefully and, um, and deliberately. And as we look at, uh, this would be slide 27 for those following along. Um, I would say following along at home, but we're all pretty much following along at home. For those following along uh, on the PowerPoint, um, just one quick slide here on the biological goals and objectives for the, for the covered wildlife species. And the reason why I think it's important to talk about this now is because as we then get into the discussion in a minute about 
the conservation strategies for the species, you'll see how they directly connect to the biological objectives that we have worked on. That's why we spent so much time thinking about biological objectives for each of the species. Um, a reminder that, uh, and I'm not going to show you all of the, the goals and objectives again because we did that before, but a reminder that for the covered wildlife species, um, we basically set an individual goal for each of our covered species, and then we had a set of objectives to support that goal for each of the covered species. And generally, um, you know, there was a lot of similarities between the goals that we set, and generally the idea is to support the persistence of each of the covered wildlife species in the permit area. Um, again, some deliberate words there. Uh, we know that um, our permit area is part of a larger landscape and a, and a, and a very variable land ownership, uh, you know, kind of around the permit area, but um, we really can only control what's happening in the permit area, and so that's why we say in the permit area. Um, and then the objectives are a collection of, of um, a, a collection location um, and then sometimes we don't know if uh, if a part of the forest is occupied because um, surveys haven't been conducted we have we don't have complete survey coverage and so uh, we do want to conserve and serve maintain and enhance suitable habitat even in places where occupancy might not be known but we have uh, some indications that we have um, pretty high habitat quality for the covered species and this is where um, our habitat modeling will come in, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. And the habitat modeling is really meant only to kind of fill in the gaps in places where we don't have good survey data for our species. And then I think the most important through line on our, uh, on our biological objectives for the species is the intention to uh, increase the quality and quantity of habitat during the permit term. So we want to uh, expand where habitat is um, as compared to today and make the habitat better. Um, and I'll explain why the modeling approach that we're using um, is also important to help, helping us answer that question. So on to slide 28. Um, one thing that we've been doing as we've been thinking about the terrestrial conservation strategy is, is sort of uh, sequencing of species. And um, certainly don't want to leave any impression that we're, we're valuing one species over the other. We have to treat all species equally in the conservation plan. Um, but it will be no surprise to, to all of you that we, um, we certainly know more about some of the species and some species are, um, you know, have, a, have a, a larger geographic footprint within the permit area. And so they just by definition become a bit more of a focus. Those two species are, are Northern Spotted Owl and Marble Marilette. I'll talk through the data and the modeling for those two species in a second, but it's no surprise to you that um, those would garner a little bit more of our attention, at least initially, because owls are more widely distributed. We have more data on them. Uh, Marble marionettes are, are not as widely distributed, but we do certainly have a long survey history with that species. And so we want to first and foremost think through what are the strategies for those two species and then uh, turn our attention to the, the remaining three, red tree vole, organ slender salamander, and coastal marten. Um, there may be some unique uh, locations or some unique strategies we need to employ for red tree vole, organ slender salamander, or coastal marten. Um, but we first want to develop our strategies for spotted owl and marble marionette, and then take a step back and ask the question, okay, have we covered those other three species adequately or do we need to do more? So that's, that's a very kind of general uh, um, idea of, of the basic approach here. A couple of slides on individual species, and um, you know most of this, but I thought it was important to walk, walk through it today just so that um, so, so we're all on the same page. So first looking at Northern Spotted Owl, um, of course we have good long-term survey data uh, on that species on state lands, uh, and as the biological objective noted, um, our intention would be to focus on locations that have been uh, active recently. Um, so places that we know the species is currently occupying, that we, we want that to be a focus. Um, we also want to focus on um, places that maybe haven't been active recently, but certainly have some history of activity in the past. And we know particularly with spotted owls, um, they've been heavily influenced by the presence of barred owls uh, in the recent past. 
And so where they are today may not be indicative of, of where they you know, where they were historically or where we would like to be in the, you know, to be in the future. And so we are thinking both of those locations that are recently active, but also those places where there may have been a lot of activity, activity in the past. Um, and then, you know, sort of just weighing and prioritizing those locations, we're certainly thinking about, um, particularly those that are, haven't been active in a while, we're certainly thinking about those that are uh, near sites that are currently active um, or are in locations that are, uh, are identified for other purposes, for other covered species. Um, that would be a, a valuable thing to sort of make sure we're getting multi-species benefits in those locations. Um, places where um, Oregon Department of Forestry has more of an influence on the landscape, so larger blocks of ownership, of course, that would be an easier thing to accommodate um, places that are not currently occupied, but we would like to be occupied in the future. Um, and then, you know, by and large, trying to create, uh, you know, an ecologically robust conservation plan, we want to make sure that we do have good representation um, of the species range um, kind of across ODF ownership. So that's another thing we'll be looking at. Um, we're also looking at not just uh, northern spotted owl sites that are on ODF ownership, but certainly those that are pretty close nearby, um, maybe on adjacent ownership, but, but right off of state lands, because we know that state lands, the way northern spotted owls use the landscape, state lands would still be um, providing some benefit to those sites that are just off, off of state lands. And so we are looking at some adjacency here and thinking about the kind of the relative land use and performance of those sites over time. Um, and then, you know, all of this is really getting towards a situation where we're sort of prioritizing sites with the highest current and future value for spotted owls and making sure that those become our areas of conservation focus for the species. Now, the same is sort of true for Marble Mirillet. Um, we certainly have good long-term survey data. We don't have complete survey coverage for that species, of course, um, but we have pretty good long-term survey data. Uh, and in this case, we are focusing kind of first and foremost on the observation data that we have for Mirlet. So thinking, of course, about uh, places where we have significant observations um, or, you know, sort of observations that are tipping us off that there might be some nesting activity nearby, uh, but also thinking about other observations that might just be um, categorized as visual or audio, um, auditory observations, um, because those, of course, play a role in the overall ecology of the species. Um, and then for this species, we will start to fill in the gaps a little bit with a species a habitat suitability model, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, because we don't have complete survey coverage, we want to not only pick up the areas where um, mirrorlets have been observed at some point in the past, but also areas that are, are kind of grading out as higher quality habitat on the landscape. Um, and then I wanted to mention Marble Mirrorlet Management Areas, that's the abbreviation there, or otherwise known as TRIMAs. Um, we're certainly using those uh, marble mirrorlet management areas as a guide in the work that we're doing, um, but we're not really thinking of those as an endpoint. And what I mean by that is you would imagine that as we think about these areas of conservation focus, trimas are, are mostly gonna be inside of those areas just by definition because they um, were derived by you know, observational data from mirrorlets, for example. Um, but we aren't using those trimas as sort of a, a starting or a stopping place. They're really just a guide to inform the overall strategy. So I think that's an important point. Um, and then lastly, and importantly for this species, also thinking about desirable patch size. So, you know, bigger is always better, of course, and there's some practic practicability uh, discussions to be had around that. Um, but is there a minimum size uh, that we would want to avoid, uh, you know, calling a conservation area uh, for that species? And so we're, we're having those conversations now. And then um, through the last few species on one slide, because they're all, they all have sort of similar data quality and, and availability um, uh, uh, issues. And that is that, you know, for each of these, for the Oregon Slender Salamander, the Red Trevo, and Coastal Martin, we have a pretty limited survey data. There certainly, there are survey data available for those species, um, but it's pretty limited on state lands. And so we are having to sort of infer habitat use from what we know about species occurrence in, in other places. Uh, and we'll be relying in that way uh, more on habitat models for those species than we would be on just, um, just occurrence data because we just simply don't have the, the, the survey coverage that we'd like to have. So for all of these species um, relying more heavily on habitat models than on occurrence data, 
Um, and probably the outlier there is coastal martin, um, which is a species that we have both uh, limited survey data on and some uh, difficulty modeling habitat for the species, um, mostly because um, most of the, or pretty much all of the survey work for that species that has been conducted and the information we have about habitat use by that species are in places where the, uh, the habitat is pretty different than what we have on our, uh, in our permit area. And so we are going to be relying more, um, more on the strategies from the other cover species and then also relying more heavily on uh, monitoring and adaptive management program for and then we might for the other species, for example. Um, later, I'm going to talk about the aquatic strategy, but just a note here that, of course, we are covering the, the Cascade torrent salamander and the Columbia torrent salamander. Those salamanders are aquatic species, so they're, they're almost always in the water. Uh, and so the, the aquatic strategy that I'll talk about in a minute uh, will fully address the needs of those species. That's our intention. So uh, just a word here on habitat modeling, and, and I know this is a lot at once, but, um, but I think we'll power through, and then if you have any questions, that'll be good. So um, I mentioned already the need for habitat modeling and why we're doing it, but, but it's important to note why we're, why we're doing it and the methods we're using, uh, because they are very deliberate. So the first thing is that we are developing habitat models for, for just four of our species, as I mentioned. So the, the owl, the mirrorlet, tree vole, and slender salamander. And what we're doing is um, we're looking to the literature and um, into other published uh, and using published information to learn key habitat characteristics for those species. Um, there is, uh, particularly with owls and mirrorlets, there has been a, a lot of work on that on those issues. So a lot of papers, um, several models published, and so we're looking to all of that information to really define the key habitat characteristics. And in many cases, that work is already and those other publications. And then using a combination of those of, of parameters in the stand level inventory data, so the forest inventory data, to represent those habitat characteristics on the landscape. So we're, we're looking uh, to the literature to figure out what the characteristics of, of, of uh, you know, quality habitat are, and then finding ways using the stand level uh, inventory data, the forest inventory data, to represent those habitat characteristics on the landscape. And that connection uh, between the species habitat models and the forest inventory model are, are really important, and I'll explain why here, uh, or I'll explain why here in a second. Um, where we end up with that then is with kind of a, a gradation of species habitat quality within our model. And I'm oversimplifying here, but you would imagine that we might have low, moderate, and high quality habitat um, for each of the species. We actually have it a little bit more nuanced than that and typically run like four to five different um, uh, quality class uh, classifications. And we've tried to um, align those classifications with what we've seen in other published habitat models um, uh, from researchers. Uh, and this allows for the creation uh, of, of, this, of a habitat model, as I mentioned, that can be, that can inform where we think species are more likely to occur than not and then link it in with forest inventory so it allows for better long-term planning or, or better long-term predicting of what habitat quality might be over time. Um, and so currently the modeling process still underway. Um, we are we're getting a peer review of the, the modeling work. Um, we've gotten most of that peer review back. Uh, and then we're also comparing our model outputs with those other models that I mentioned that we're, that we're drawing from. Um, to see the similarities and differences between those models. They are different methods, and we understand that. Um, but we do want to understand the, the similarities and differences uh, between the model outputs and, and make sure that we're reasonably aligned with those other models um, so that we can, so, you know, so that we feel um, confident in our, in our output, in our model results. And the benefits of the modeling approach um, really come hey, down Troy, to this. Yes, sorry. Can I just interrupt for one sec just to kind of watch our time? to be able to get to the aquatics in case some people have to leave at three. Yeah. Just I, as a thought. Okay, I, thanks. I appreciate yeah. that, yeah. And then we're running about 20 minutes behind, so I'll do my best. Um, so um, really quickly, the benefits of the modeling approach, um, it certainly allows for, allows for an analysis of, of how habitat quality and quantity will change over time. So remember in our objectives, that's one of the things we're committing to is an in, in, increase in quality and quantity of habitat over time. And this will allow us to at least model what that habitat quality might look like over time. Um, 
and it allows for a better understanding of how management actions inside of these conservation areas would actually influence habitat quality. So imagine we, uh, we were going to have um, a civil cultural prescription in a conservation area with the intention of, to keep it simple, grow bigger uh, and taller trees over time, the model can tell us whether or not we, that's actually going to be a reality in our 70 year permit term. So it allows us to um, better understand and be more intentional about what those prescriptions might be. And then uh, it also allows us, and the last bullet here is to determine kind of the relative level of investment needed to increase uh, habitat quality over time. So how much would we need to spend and when to make those habitat improvements over time? And is it, is it worth it in the, in the grand scheme of things to do that? And if the answer is yes, then we would actually, we would definitely want to do that. If the answer is, you know, you see a, only a marginal increase in 70 years or so, um, then it, we may want to invest that, uh, that money somewhere else, for example. So lastly here, um, just a little bit of new terminology, because I know we need new terminology all the time. We have, have created a term called habitat conservation areas. And we're pulling all of this information together, the survey information, the, the habitat models, um, and, and now to sort of delineate habitation areas on the landscape. Um, and uh, essentially what we're trying to do is to, you know, optimize where conservation actions are going to be occurring, um, trying to accommodate as many as our cover species in the habitat conservation areas as we can. Um, though some habitat conservation areas might only be uh, for one species. Um, so most of them will accommodate most of our species, which I think is helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we were, we've always been striving to make uh, sort of bigger is better, if you will, but we are finding as we're doing this work that there is quite a variation in the size of habitat conservation areas. So there's no magic size or number here. Sometimes they're um, small, sometimes they're a little larger, and it really depends on the landscape and the planning context that we're working with. Uh, and as of now, and this is the work that's happening, uh, we're, we're actually working on uh, delineating those, those HCAs now. And then we are working with an assumption that some civil cultural activities will be occurring in those HCAs, as I mentioned, to help benefit uh, species habitat over time. Um, but we've really just begun those conversations, so not much more to say about that today. Um, but, but note that that is the intention as we move forward. Deb, would you like to go through the aquatic strategy slides as well, and then we can do Q&A on all of it. Yeah, I was actually thinking so, and I was going to make a plea to people who thought they would leave at 3 o'clock to try to stay till at least 3.30, just to be able to hear all the aquatics information. I just think it's, it's really critically important information, both the terrestrial and the aquatics. And I see Heath Curtis has his hand up, and I was hoping I could hold the questions to the end of both of these sections. Um, Keith, I hope there, you can be patient on that. It's just <laughs> analytically just a little different than the aquatic strategy. That is to say, the habitat investments on the terrestrial strategy kind of require just a little different approach. And if it's okay, I might just ask one quick question here. I Troy, you talk, about, you talk about, you know, the investment required over, you know, the term of the HCP to produce high quality habitat. I'm, I'm curious what you view as uh, the legal obligation under an HCP to produce high quality habitat. That is to say over a 70 year term, a stand is going to change characteristics a great deal. And I wondered what obligation you felt ODF had to, to actually do that. Thanks, Heath. That's a great question. Um, and I think that gets really at the heart of the value of this, of, of this methodology we're talking about. And that is um, certainly the, the, um, the criteria or the sort of the issuance criteria or the requirements aren't to improve all habitat everywhere. Um, but more importantly, what we're looking at is balancing sort of the habitat value, uh, the amount of habitat and the value of habitat against what will be lost from covered activities over time. And so, you know, all we're ultimately trying to do is avoid and minimize and mitigate uh, the, the effects to species. And so one thing I'm not talking about today here, but is also running in parallel is an assessment of what do we think the effects to species habitat could be over time. And then, you know, in trading what we think those effects might be with what we think we're, or what we can model that we're going to gain in terms of species habitat value over time, 
it allows us to have a discussion about those, those kind of trade-offs. So in terms of the investment, what, what I was using the term investment in terms of like, if we wanted to go in and actively manage, um, you know, a stand or, you know, have a, a harvest unit or even a, an entire habitat conservation area, because we thought it was going to accelerate habitat development and we needed, and we needed to accelerate habitat development to provide that trade-off, you know, then we, we, we can understand the realities of that. Um, but uh, because I guess the, the, um, the flip side of that is, you know, most uh, forest HCPs, and I think this is a totally fine approach, just, we just assume, you know, everything is going to grow over time, 50, 70, 80 years, or whatever the permit term is, uh, and value will get better, but, um, you know, we know that there are some nuances to that as well. So I think that's, that's how I would answer that. That's a good answer. Thanks for that. So Deb, I think I'll move on to the aquatic strategy and go through this and then we can go to Q&A and then if it um, sort of bleeds in, into the discussion period, I think that would be great. So um, the, the aquatic strategy, um, a little bit different, of course, than the terrestrial strategy, but uh, certainly is as important. Um, so similarly, I'm gonna walk through these steps here with you uh, and then I'm gonna switch over to uh, another PDF and just show you a visual of what this is beginning to look like. Um, so going on to slide 39, the reminder of the biological of, of goals and objectives for fish. Uh, we actually only had one goal for all of our fish species, and that was to support the persistence of, of covered fish in the permit area uh, by maintaining and enhancing habitats and streams um, over the permit term. And then a reminder that the objectives basically came down to, uh, we're really focused on stream uh, processes and habit, in stream habitat quality. So we were looking at uh, promotion of, of long-term wood recruitment, um, enhancing the overall you know, channel complexity through targeted enhancement projects, uh, maintaining and enhancing water quality and quantity, um, focused primarily there on sediment, and then uh, improving fish passage over time. So those were kind of our four main um, areas of focus and our objectives. And in putting together our, um, our aquatic conservation strategy, uh, staying pretty true to those, and it, it really is broken down into three um, three key areas. And I'm, I'm not going to talk much today or really at all about the, the road network management or the stream enhancement projects. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the, the riparian buffer strategy, but I just wanted to put it up here because I didn't want it to get, uh, I didn't want us to lose sight of the fact that there, there really is more to the aquatic strategies than just riparian buffers. Um, when we think about the, the biological objectives and, you know, um, and thinking about sediment, and thinking about um, uh, in-stream habitat quality and, and all of those words that I had on the previous slide, uh, managing the road, the existing road network and thinking about, you know, how new roads will be built, you know, when and where and how, and then thinking about stream enhancement projects and how we will focus those in key areas to benefit species. Those are gonna be as much uh, and as important uh, to the aquatic strategy as the riparian buffers are. So um, more, more on that probably at a future meeting, but I just wanted you to know that there is kind of a three-pronged approach here. Um, as we get into the riparian buffer discussion, uh, uh, another important terminology shift. Uh, so to be sort of parallel with the idea of habitat conservation areas on the terrestrial side and HCAs, we are talking now about uh, riparian conservation areas or RCAs. So um, riparian conservation area is akin to riparian buffers by and large, um, but riparian conservation area we think is a little bit more um, holistic uh, terminology uh, and sort of encompasses everything that might be occurring in those areas. And um, I think the key questions here are always, you know, how big are the, how big are the RCAs and where are they applied? Uh, and our intention with this process has always been to, to tie the, the, the riparian conservation strategy to those stream functions that we are highlighting in our biological objectives. Um, so, you know, what do we need to do? What does science tell us about what we need to do in terms of temperature and sediment and wood? Um, and let the, let that information really drive what we're doing here. Um, of course, we're considering um, as it relates to that the size of the streams and the type of streams, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and then um, all the while, I want to memorialize the process of laying out the stream buffers, um, you know, in a in a temp. So, uh, as you may know, ODF currently does it that way. So when they are laying out a timber sale, um, delineating the riparian buffers are certainly part of that. Um, that's not going to go away. That'll still be happening under the HCP. And so 
um, we've been doing a lot of work to make sure that what we're proposing um, would, would actually work um, on the landscape in the future. So the variations um, in the concert in the riparian conservation areas um, really are informed by the following bullets here, um, whether or not it's a fish bearing stream, which stands to reason, uh, the size of the stream and the location of the stream and the watershed. So um, is the stream, you know, where is the stream relative to fish bearing stream? So if we're in a non fish bearing stream or a type in stream, where is that stream relative to fish? And that might influence what we want to do there. Uh, and then um, also thinking about locations that have a high debris flow or a high landslide potential. Again, thinking about the ability to capture uh, wood recruitment in the future. Um, and then all the while striving to minimize sediment and temperature increases, two of our other kind of uh, tenets of our biological objectives um, that we're trying to accomplish as well. And then um, last slide here, I think, before I turn to a, a graphic to show you, but um, as we lay the buffering strategy out, we then will be um, asking questions about, um, are we adequately protecting some of the key features of the landscape that we're, that we're trying to protect? Um, so looking at, you know, intrinsic potential of our, of our covered fish species, um, focusing on areas with high landslide and debris flow potential. So I mentioned that part of the buffering strategy is tied to that, but we want to then go back in and double check that those areas that we know have a high debris flow potential are actually being captured by the buffering strategy. And the same is true with um, segments of the stream that might be sensitive to thermal loading. So places where we think water might be getting warmer in the future, how are, are, are we adequately protecting those areas? Um, are, you know, do we have a strategy for areas that have a high risk of low summer flows? All things that we are certainly predicting. Um, somebody mentioned climate change earlier, and um, these are aspects of, of the overall strategy where climate change will really um, play a role. And we're, we're using uh, modeling from terrain works that is informed by climate change models that help identify these places on the landscape. Uh, and then lastly, um, when we think about the stream enhancement piece uh, and restoration, um, where are those, those key uh, flood, you know, places where we might want to reconnect floodplains or, or do some off-channel restoration that would really benefit our covered species? And then of course, lastly, making sure that what, whatever the strategy is that it's getting um, as much wood into the system as we, as we can do practically. And so uh, let me just bear with me for a second here, and I'm just going to switch over to a different, um, stop sharing and then I'll reshare. Different graphic, it'll just take a second. Um, I think. Okay, there it is. For whatever reason, I'm not, so what I'm going to do is share my, okay, so hopefully you can see my, uh, this kind of cartoon graphic now. Um, so just two things to point out here, and then we can go to questions, but I thought it was useful to show you I this graphic. We, we just see you, or does everybody else see a graphic? Oh, <laughs> I just see Troy. Sorry. Because we like seeing you, Troy. There it is. Okay. Now I, have to hit, I have to hit the share button. Um, thank you. <laughs> You're on. You're on. Good. So um, two, a couple things to walk you through here. And this first, first thing, this is kind of a two-part um, two graphic. So the first one, and I apologize, I don't want to make it too small because I think that you'll lose some resolution there. So I'll just kind of walk through it. But we have a series of, of um, examples here of how you might define the aquatic zone. So the easiest example is just when there's just a simple stream and the stream bank is very clear and there's nothing adjacent. Obviously, any buffering strategy would start at the edge of that stream bank. Um, but there might be cases where you have adjacent wetlands or beaver ponds or some side channel migration. Um, and the channel, mig channel migration zone might be actually wider than the main stem channel. Um, or there might be some seeps and springs adjacent, and it's important. This is, this is um, sort of standard practice, but important to note that um, this is all different ways of defining what the aquatic zone is, and the buffering strategy would, would pick up at the edge of that aquatic zone and be buffered out from there. So in the next graphic, I'll 
a series of relatively simple examples of what that might look like, but just bear in mind that the, the aquatic um, if the aquatic zone might be defined slightly different on the landscape depending on what's adjacent to the stream as well. Um, and then um, just two graphics here that I'll put up at the same time um, and I think are kind of informative and I'll start with the one on the bottom. Uh, and apologies for those that are not seeing the screen. We weren't able to send this one out to the group, but, um, but hopefully most of you are. So this is just a very simplistic example of what the, what the buffering strategy might look like as you go up into the watershed. So just to start on the right, um, we're looking at a, you know, either a perennial or a seasonal fish bearing stream, um, which would be buffered uh, at some level. And then you can imagine as you go up into the watershed, um, you have a small perennial fish bearing stream also buffered um, here, you can see. But then that stream is gonna transition as you go up up the watershed. So it's going to transition first from a fish bearing stream into a perennial non fish bearing stream. And so we would designate uh, the area, the upper extent of fish use, and that would constitute a change in the buffering strategy. So um, the buffer would, would be reduced after or above um, the upper extent of fish use. But we've created this, um, this kind of new terminology around a temperature protection zone. And this is um, we're, we're working on defining the length of this zone and the buffering strategies within that zone, but there's interest in the scoping team and really making sure that we protect stream temperature in these streams they, that don't have fish, but they are right above uh, fish bearing streams. And so whatever happens here um, would certainly have an influence on the temperature of water as it goes into those fish bearing streams. So we're working on the buffering strategy in, the, in what we're calling the temperature protection zone. Um, and then beyond that, you can, you can see that we're sort of imagining a slightly wider buffer there, but then beyond that temperature protection zone, the buffer dropping down again. So sort of a tapering effect as you go up the watershed. Um, and then um, another change would happen at the end of perenniality. So when a perennial stream uh, turns into a seasonal stream, so you can see a perennial non-fish bearing stream uh, becomes a seasonal non-fish bearing stream. At that point, uh, we would have a transition zone. So there's often some uncertainty about that, where that per perenniality um, initiation point is. So we'd have a little bit of a buffer there um, just to be conservative. And then above that in the seasonal type, uh, type end or the seasonal non-fish bearing stream, um, not, a, not a hard edge buffer, but certainly um, a restriction on ground-based equipment. And that's what's shown here with this hatched line. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of like basic overview of what the the difference between the, the example I'm showing here on the bottom and the one on the top is that on the top, this is a, uh, a stream that has a, a potential debris flow track. So this is a high debris flow or a high energy stream. And you can see the main difference here is that the buffering of the high debris flow stream goes all the way up and around the initiation point. So slightly different than a stream that's not a high debris flow stream where we get up into the seasonal type in, and we just have an equipment restriction in that seasonal type in. Um, in the high debris flow example on the top, we're actually buffering all the way up and around the top of that um, debris flow initiation point. And the intention there, as you recall, is to when, if and when that debris flow occurs to capture um, as much of the wood as we can and get it down into um, the fish bearing system. So those are two fairly simplistic examples, but I think, um, uh, it, it kind of articulate the nuances and the new terminology of the strategy um, uh, overall. And then the last thing I'll say, and we can revisit all of these, so I'm not moving on, but we can revisit all of these in the Q&A. Um, the last thing I'll say is just a reminder that when we talk about um, the, the distance from the stream, so how wide will the buffer be, um, we're talking here in this HCP in terms of uh, horizontal distance. So the distance horizontally from, uh, from the stream itself, uh, you know, straight across the landscape uh, to where that, in this case, we're showing a foot uh, distance to where that, um, and the, the reason why I learned is that in some cases, that buffer distance um, by some other, by other landowners is measured in slope distance. And that just simply means that you would walk up the slope 35 feet and that's where your buffer would start instead of walking up the hill and looking back at the trees along the stream here, 
uh, and measuring a horizontal distance. And so this graphic is showing um, the difference between horizontal distance, the straight distance, and slope distance um, over four different slope um, slopes from zero to 100% slope. And the important thing to note here is that as you go, as the slope gets steeper, um, the difference between horizontal difference and slope distance becomes greater. So if you're flat ground, um, it's gonna be, in this example, 35 feet, whether you're horizontal distance or slope distance. But if you go up to 100% slope, um, you can see that uh, a 35 foot um, uh, horizontal distance actually measures out to be about 49 feet um, on the landscape. So it's quite, quite a bit larger. Um, important, the reason why we're pointing this out is so that uh, when we say, uh, share so much information in such a short amount of time and you have quite the way of distilling it so thank you for that really well done um i want to pause before we jump into questions in case for some people that might have to leave i want to see liz if there's anything you just want to say briefly i don't mean to put you on the spot but um we're going to go into questions but we are kind of in that three to four window so liz i just want to pause in case you want to make any jump in with a few remarks and then we'll go to the Q&A in the last hour. Go ahead, Liz. Just uh, real quickly, there, there was and is a lot of information to cover there. So um, really appreciate the folks that are engaged here trying to take it all in. I don't wanna take up any more time. I'd rather have folks have time for um, asking questions. Well, thank you for that, Liz. And so even though we're kind of transitioning in, into this informal zone, I think it's a perfect use of the time. So this is now an opportunity for people to be able to go ahead and raise your hands if you have questions either about terrestrial and aquatics, and we'll take it on both of those topics. And then Sylvia, I know that you've kindly also been kind of gathering questions in general in case we have anything else. I know we may, if we lose a few people, we wanna thank you for having been with us, for having been um, up for the challenge of virtual meetings. And overall, um, just please remember that all this information is available online on the website. If you have questions, go ahead and send them by email to Jason or other comments that we didn't get a chance to hear. And now we're gonna also look to the queue and see who has their hand up and please feel free. We have from three o'clock to four o'clock and you've got a great group of folks ready to engage with you. Um, Deb, so, um, I, oh, go ahead, Troy, of course, yeah. yeah if I could add, if, if, if people have questions and they want me to show, go back to the PowerPoint or to, to go mm -hmm. anywhere in particular on any of these handouts, just direct me and I'll do my best. Yes, good, good. So um, thank you for that. And so go ahead, I have Heath up first and then I have Mary Skurlock afterwards. Go ahead, Heath. Thanks. Uh, Troy, in this graphic, this is perfect that you have here. I, I wondered uh, on the bottom there that buffering between the temperature protection zone and the transition zone, uh, what what functions are you serving to, are, are you trying to preserve uh, or enhance there? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm pointing to it here on the screen for folks um, to, to articulate Heath's question. So Heath, I think the, the key things there that we're trying to preserve would be um, retaining the, the wood recruitment function, the wood recruitment ability. So we, we wanna make sure we get that wood into the system if, it, if and when it falls. And then um, of course sediment, uh, which would be uh, both here and as you go up uh, into the, even the seasonal type ends. So I would say sediment and wood would be the two functions we're, we're primarily focused on in that case. Yeah, wood movement in those small, perennial type ends beyond the zone of temperature influence uh, would be pretty limited. I, I look forward to uh, watching how that conversation develops. Excellent, yeah, thank you. Okay, so that was Heath and then Mary. Good luck, go ahead and uh, Jason, let me pause Mary, can you wait one sec? 
Jason, do you have something you needed to break in and tell us? I just have a couple of questions that have come in over here, and uh, that was just to indicate. Okay, we'll have you wait in line. So, Mary, go ahead and take your turn. Thanks. She may not be able to unmute herself. Mary? She looks like she's off mute. Mary, you should Mary, you should be off mute. If you're not able to speak for some reason, you can write your question into the chat and I can try to or or send it to Jason. We also do have a question that came in through the chat, which I can go ahead and ask now, which was from Mark um, Rasmussen asking, will the HCP consider active management to create desirable aquatic conditions? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, good question. We've been talking a lot about that at the scoping team, um, and we're still talking about it. Um, I think that, that overall, I would say um, we don't quite know yet. That certainly has been the intention, the intention um, would be to do some active management in there. Um, I think as the conversations has, have evolved at the scoping team, that if we do active management, it would be pretty targeted. Um, and, and I think not because there's any worry about that work happening, but more about uh, kind of considering what value would those actions actually have on the habitat quality over time. Uh, we're just now, literally a couple of days ago, um, at a place where we, um, we, are a, we have a, sort of this buffering strategy built into GIS and are able to do a better job of characterizing the forest in, in the riparian area. Um, within these buffer zones. And so that I think will lead us into kind of more detailed discussion about um, potential for active management and if so, what and where would we want that to occur. So the conversation's definitely on the, been on the table and we've been talking about it quite a lot. Okay, so um, I am actually typing to Mary. Sylvia, it looks like she might have only joined in to the video and might not have a speaker on. Yeah. So we'll give Mary a chance to try to join back in. And Jason, why don't you go ahead and read us a few questions? That would be great. Or maybe one at a time. Go ahead. Uh, well, one of them was the chat question from Mark, so we got that covered. Um, Bob Van Dykes of uh, the Wild Salmon Center was asking, uh, has the riparian team uh, considered an aquatic anchor strategy that sorts watersheds for different strategies depending on importance for species. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Bob, for that question. Um, we we have we started down that path initially, and we're I think right about now ready to loop back around to it. And and again, going back to my comment a second ago about um, I think now having the uh, some some better handle on what we think the uh, the aquatic strategy is going to look like. And being able to think about that, um, you know, watershed by watershed or basin by basin, and then making some determinations at the species level and really at the population level, um, do we feel like we're doing enough uh, in a in a particular population for for that species? Um, and then, if not, uh, what you know, what else might we want to do or need to do? Um, the other element of that of this is. Um, of course, we're talking about, and I'm showing the aquatic strategy sort of as if it's in isolation. Um, earlier, we were talking about the habitat conservation or the habitat um, uh, conservation areas uh, strategy on the terrestrial side. And of course, those strategies will be merging on the lands landscape. So even in places where we have an aquatic strategy like this, like I'm showing on the screen, there will be additional um, you know, conservation happening in the, in the watershed potentially because of the terrestrial strategy. So understanding the interaction of those two, uh, the terrestrial and the, and the aquatic strategy would be important uh, as part of that analysis. So absolutely. And, and maybe just to follow on with that, I think from the beginning we've known and, and um, National Marine Fishery Service has made it clear that, um, you know, they will be thinking about the benefits, kind of the effects and the benefits of the strategy um, on fish species at the population level. And so we'll, we're, we also are think, obviously thinking about it at that level. And so the information in the HCP will be, um, will be uh, presented um, at that level as well. Okay. And Mary should be unmuted now. I think we figured it out. 
Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, cool. Um, so uh, I think my question is basically to try to sum it up is there is a list on page 43 of the way that data and model outputs or the subjects uh, that are informed by data and model outputs to validate uh, the aquatic buffering strategy. And I guess my question is, can you say more about the extent to which the, those um, data and model outputs that are being applied are new products developed for this process versus the application of previously published models? Excellent, thank you. Yes, Mary, and I'm, I was, I'm going back to find it to remind myself what list we were looking at. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a co certainly a combination, I would say, of those things. So, um, you know, uh, information like intrinsic potential obviously is something that um, you know, has been done before, and we're certainly using the best published version of that uh, to date. Um, but then many of the other things like um, identifying areas with um, high landslide or high debris flow potential or uh, stream, stream segments that are sensitive to thermal loading, for example, the low summer flow, um, a lot of that is new, and it's work that is, um, it's really a combination of um, ODF's existing data that they have from, you know, years of being out on the ground and, and, and measuring and finding those things, combining that with modeling that is being done by uh, Terrain Works by uh, Lee Benda and Dan Miller, um, and um, basically creating a stream network with, uh, with all of that in mind, and which then allows us to model um, not just sort of current conditions, but also future conditions, as I mentioned, thinking about climate change. Um, so that some of that is new. Um, some of it, some of it had been done for for pieces of state lands as as parts of other efforts. Um, but we, as part of this effort, had had them kind of fill in the gaps in that work across the the geography. Um, so I think I think that part's new, um, but it won't be anything different in terms of. I think the kind of outputs won't be anything different than what you've seen before. It'll be, it'll be um, familiar uh, data to you or information to you, but, but certainly some areas had not been modeled before. And then lastly, um, the wood recruitment potential is also new. Um, that work is, is still underway um, because we're still kind of we're working on it to finalize the actual buffering strategy and thinking about some different scenarios. Um, and so the modeling of the potential to recruit wood into the system Will be another step that Terrain Works does, um, you know, in the coming weeks and, and months here. So a lot of new, but uh, but but relying on some existing as well. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, the the three in the middle there, the the more um, uh, granular stuff, the stream segments sensitive to thermal loading, stream segments at risk of low summer flow, and key how you sort of define and find and buffer floodplain off-channel areas. I mean, it's one thing to talk about them conceptually, it's another thing to map them. So do we, are, are those actually gonna be um, um, specifically and spatially, you know, it's gonna be spatially explicit in our, our mapping that we're gonna find these places or are they just gonna be described in a narrative way? In they the are, yeah, great, great question. Yeah, thank you. They are, they are um, you know, discrete areas within GIS that are identified. Okay. Now, of course, they're modeled, so um, they won't all have been ground truthed, but, um, but the model is, is the best we will have. Um, and so one of the things I mentioned during the presentation is that the utility of those things is that um, when we look at the buffering strategy, we can then go to those places and, and see how we feel about, for example, um, areas, stream segments that have been modeled as being sensitive to thermal loading. Right. Do we feel like the buffering strategy is adequate to deal with that, even if it doesn't occur, you know, until some point far in the future? We want to be prepared for that. So yeah, those are the screen lines. Right. So the modeling might be good for also estimating what the footprint of those areas might be, even if you still need a field protocol for finding them. Oh, for sure. On the ground. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Appreciate it. So I'm gonna take a couple of these hands that are up and then I'll check back with Jason again for any others online. So Chris Farr, you're up and then Dave Eisenhoff next. Okay, can, I, don't, I can't tell if you can hear me or not. So 
you may assign. We can go ahead. Okay. Gotcha. I I have actually a multitude of questions, but I'll focus in on uh, the hydrology. That's where my background is, and uh, I have a, a general one, and then a couple more specific. The general one is: Do you think that you have sufficient hydrologic data in terms of uh, flows and um, the other parameters in terms of quality that you consider important, like temperature and sediment loads? Do you have sufficient data to actually model uh, enough of the hydrologic system to be able to have it um, contribute significantly to this habitat plan? So that's my general one. So I don't know if somebody wants to address that. Just my my perception is there aren't a lot of uh, actual streamflow gauges in the region. They're um, they're variable in their uh, historic records and things like that. And so it concerns me that you know you may not have sufficient data to really refine these um, hydrologic component of your model very well. And the other thing that's general, when you discuss the stream uh, kind of rainfall runoff model, I guess, that you might have, are you also trying to work in groundwater and surface water interaction? Because that's very important as far as water temperature. Absolutely, thank you. And maybe I'll maybe I'll take the first cut at both of those, um, and then Mike Wilson or or someone else at ODF might want to weigh in as well. So um, on the data data quality question, I would say I feel I feel pretty good about the data quality question. Um, we are doing a kind of a combination or a hybrid approach of um, you know even if there you know may not be a lot of stream gauges out in the, on the landscape, for example. Um, ODF has a pretty robust, uh, you know, uh, data set, stream data set, uh, and and I'm not just you know just in terms of like um, seasonality and perenniality, but even you know end of fish use, for example, or or maybe the end of perennial points that are in this buffering strategy as I laid it out earlier. So we took that information that they had, which is very much kind of a ground based, uh, a lot of that is kind of ground based knowledge. And combine that with um, some some new uh, modeling that Trainworks has done on uh, those other factors as well, the same factors as well, rather. So seasonality, perenniality, et cetera. I think combined, uh, we certainly have enough information um, to use in the HCP planning process, um, and I feel even better about it knowing that you know, as I mentioned earlier, these buffers will be laid out as part of timber sales in the future, and so they're still we they're still you know, tuning this, fine tuning this on, on the landscape uh, in the future. So I think a combination of the purposes works fine. And then we have the backup in the field um, in the future. Uh, and then um, the second part of your question uh, in terms of interaction between groundwater and surface water, and, and that particularly as that relates to temperature, we actually uh, began that discussion at our last uh, last aquatic scoping team meeting and, and had some good discussions around that. Um, we, at least right now, uh, haven't gotten to the point where we're trying to, you know, to pull in, like holistically pull in um, more uh, more in-depth modeling that would, you know, speak to the interaction between groundwater and surface water. Um, but but what we may do in the future is look at some key areas again, looking, thinking through. Um, if we feel like our, our buffering strategy might need to be uh, bulked up in a couple of places because maybe temperature is an issue for whatever reason, uh, we might do some targeted looking at some of those locations using some of the other kind of modeling that's going on um, in the state. But as of right now, we haven't been doing that, but there's certainly an acknowledgement in the scoping team that groundwater plays a big, uh, a big part, uh, has a big influence on temperature. Okay. Well, thank you. That's that's enough for now. I'll give somebody else a chance. Okay. Thank you for that, Chris, and thanks for the question. So, Dave Ivanoff is up, and then Seth Barnes next. Well, thank you, Deb. Um, I'm not sure if this should go to uh, you, Troy, or somebody in ODF, but um, 
it's a little bit unclear to me uh, as it relates to the terrestrial strategy and the biological goals and objectives. And, and a couple of points uh, that I have that seem hard for me to get my arms around to really understand what's intended was a bullet point. I think I captured it where, where it stated it was going to increase the quality and the quantity of habitat. And I guess my question is relative to what? And then, um, and then a follow-up beyond, beyond that, two follow-ups is that um, when, when I understood Brian was talking, I understood him to say that, that uh, the goal is to have um, you know, a, a healthy and resilient forest. And when I hear that phrase, it, it really speaks volumes to me about ODF having an, enough revenue or cash flow to make sure the forest is as productive as it can possibly be for not only current generations, but future generations as well. And that we needed to practice young stand management and certainly have the revenue to maintain the inventories and to deal with uh, forest health issues. Um, and so is there some understanding um, of just how much additional revenue is needed to, to end up with a healthy and resilient forest? And um, uh, then the final question I have, and gets back to the question I asked earlier on, at what point in time will we be able to start seeing some timber output levels um, uh, consistent with managing around these these aquatic and terrestrial uh, goals? So kind of three questions there, Troy. Excellent, and maybe I'll, I'll take the first one relative to the habitat quality uh, quantity and quantity, um, and then Brian might want to weigh in on the, on the forest piece. Troy, um, could, I, could I please ask you to talk a little bit louder, please? Oh, sure. Sorry Thank about you. that. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'll do my best there and let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so on the, uh, on the habitat quality and quantity, and, and I mentioned earlier, that's, you know, one of the biological objectives that we state repeatedly for, for many of our terrestrial species. Um, so the question, Dave, your question, Dave, I think was like, you know, when we're measuring that relative to what? And um, I think that really will come in two forms. It's certainly relative to, to now, you know, I would say now being when the HCP begins. Um, but we'll be really measuring that, um, we'll, we'll, I guess, first and foremost, be predicting that using our modeling efforts um, that I described. And we'll be predicting that, you know, compared to now. So Brian mentioned that the timber model we run out over 100 years, which will even go beyond our permit term, we'll be able to check in on that, you know, at five year increments. Um, and even though we probably won't, we won't look that frequently at um, species habitat quality over time, maybe, um, you know, 20 years out, 40 years out, 60 years out or something like that. Um, so the intention and the commitment would be um, just in terms of, you know, how much, and again, I'll keep it simple, but how much low, moderate, and high quality habitat do we have for a species? Uh, and really that's on the landscape, not just in the habitat conservation areas, but on the landscape. And then how does that change over time? And can we say, um, can, you know, can we say that by year 70 or whatever the end of the permit term is, um, that we have, you know, more high quality habitat um, than we did at the beginning, for, for example. Now, you could imagine that um, all things being equal, that most of that higher quality habitat or habitat that becomes higher quality would be in these habitat conservation areas because of the, that's, where the, that's what the focus would be in those um, locations. But that's not to say that there wouldn't also be some habitat values you know, across the rest of the landscape. Um, so it's kind of a twofold thing there. And then, um, and all of that is sort of built out of the modeling process I talked about. We also, um, we don't explicitly talk about um, number of, you know, number of individuals, number of owl nests or number of mirrorlets. We don't talk about that in the biological obje objectives. Uh, and we do that um, really on purpose because we know there's beyond what we're doing on ODF lands, there's a lot of other things happening um, ecologically um, and otherwise out there that might influence the, the status of those species over time. 
So we're really keen on habitat quality as our, as our way to demonstrate benefit for the species over time. That's not to say that we won't also be checking in on you know, number of owl sites and you know, now and number of owl sites in the future. We just aren't tying the success of the plan to that necessarily um, because we know that there are some other inherent challenges with just what's happening um, you know, on surrounding landscapes and with barred owls in the case of, of the northern spotted owl. And so that's why we focus so much on habitat. Um, Brian, do you want to speak to the, the forest, uh, forest questions? Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Troy. And, and thanks for, <clears throat> excuse me, Dave, thanks for asking the question again. I think I'll start with your third question, Dave, which was the timber harvest modeling outputs. And I think you had kind of queued that up when I was talking and I might have not understand it, stood it exactly at the time. So as far as modeling outputs ready for, you know, this group or public consumption, it's going to be a while. And really our next step um, that we'd like to bring to the public is more details on the conservation strategies as they get finalized. And when they do, um, and you understand this, Dave, we will put that into the model. And then I did speak to that model being an iterative process, again, with field review in there and biological review and really leadership review at ODF to um, understand the cost and benefits or the trade-offs, however you want to say that. And so I'm not going to predict the timeline there, um, knowing that modeling has many loops in it, but I'd say sometime early summer or this summer, we'd have some information out um, to you all and the interested publics on the modeling outputs and the conservation benefits of uh, the forest goals and the conservation commitments there. So more to come on the timing, but kind of walking through the process that we've set up as part of the project. And so Dave, your second question and, and kind of the crux of it is around the resilient forest and promoting that and the resilient ecosystems in kind of all kinds of um, climates over the permit term, the seven years. I think you were referring to our environmental goal, um, goal two, which is to maintain, enhance, or restore the health of Western Oregon State Forest, thereby promoting sustainability, productive, and resilient ecosystems. And then we've got a series of um, biological objectives underneath. There's eight of them that I went through, a wide range of soil productivity to forest productivity and, and habitat, both terrestrial and aquatics. And so that is how we're meeting the goal. In your question, I'm hearing the economic considerations and absolutely we know it's paramount that the department is solvent and the division can manage the forest and have the funding to do that. And we address that in the economics goal, which is a sustainable and predictable revenue source across Western Oregon forest, the permit area and over the term of the permit. And so, we are seeing them as complementary goals, but two separate goals, the resilient piece and knowing that you need the economics there to be able to manage the forest. And, and uh, we've been working on that for years, if not decades now. So can appreciate what you're, the message you're saying there and realizing that when we implement graded permit value, it is really across the landscape and across all elements of social, environmental and economics is what we're trying to achieve there. So, so Brian um, uh, and Troy, what what my basic question or concern is, and, and I think I asked this, you know, about sometime early last summer. It just it seems to me that before the conservation strategies are finalized, it seems to me that it's really important to understand the implications of those strategies relative to what you're able to produce in terms of timber output levels on a sustainable basis and understanding that, you know, following the, the, the problems with the ODFs, um, you know, financial issues going back to the great depression. It just seems to me that, um, that there it's, it's always been my impression that there was inadequate revenue coming in at at the then current harvest levels, 
And so if you're going to ensure that ODF has, has an incredibly strong financial base from which to manage these lands um, for the purpose that, that I think we all want, highly productive uh, timberlands, there has to be an understanding of, of the implications on harvest levels on conservation strategies before they're locked into place. And, and the same is true uh, on the aquatic strategies. It's, it's a little harder for me to get my head wrapped around, you know, the, the riparian buffers and what the implications are on harvest levels uh, around that. But as it relates to the terrestrial areas, it's a little easier to to at least picture in my mind, um, you know the, and and this is just from my perspective, you know, enhancing habitat where occupancy is unknown. To me, that seems uh, very very open ended, you know, and and it feels to me like we could end up in a process if we don't if we don't if we don't do this in the right sequence in my mind and it and it seems to me like the conservation and aquatic strategies need to be fully understood because it may you may ultimately end up agreeing to something that that is going to to lead to insolvency on the department's part you know for the protection of other values and um anyway i'm just i'm probably rambling right now but that's what my my concern is is that that we are going to perpetuate the same problem that we've we've faced on the forest with since 2001 and not understanding the implications of these biological goals we could be ultimately agreeing to vague policy calls and not understanding what the implications are and that and then we end up with a failure it, it do you get what i'm trying to say here I, yeah you've got you've got some heads nodding oh. with you so who wanted to jump in on that brian did you want to jump in here i i had a few comments there yeah go ahead troy and then i'll finish it up and because i'm sure there's other people in the queue yeah excellent so dave i totally agree with everything you said and that's that's pretty much exactly where we are in the process right now so we certainly have been, um, you know, working and you've been hearing a lot about conservation strategies and biological goals and objectives, and you've seen a little bit of that work today. Um, we certainly have been um, thinking about that, you know, from the perspective of what would be uh, best for the recovered species, right? Like what would be the most efficient way to put a conservation strategy on the ground? Um, and by most efficient, I mean, um, efficient in terms of, you know, managing for the species, but also efficient in terms of uh, creating, you know, flexibility on the rest of the landscape to do other uh, other uh, covered activities, namely harvest activities. So we certainly have been thinking about that, you know, leading with the science. But we have been working with, um, you know, as on the terrestrial, for example, we have been working with the uh, the ODF district staff, um, getting their And be able to calibrate the conservation strategies against, um, you know, the revenue needs over time. So you're you're absolutely right, and we're 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 tracking with you there, um, and um, I think we're almost to that point where we're ready to intersect those two those two streams. Well, thank thank you for letting me uh, express my concern. Sure. Yeah, very much appreciate it. Brian, did you have something else? Want to say? Yeah, I'm going to pass on that just in the sake of time, but I know Dave knows how to get a hold of us and we can talk more with okay. him. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. So, thank you to Dave on that. And um, I just want to note it looks like we have about five more hands up. We have about a half hour. 
Um, so I'm gonna, I'll watch the time a little bit, but Seth, you're up next and then Joseph. Go ahead, Seth. The answer kind of covered some of it, but I, I'd, I'd like to know um, specifically the dates when we might, if, or, or the, the rough timeline. It's kind of like maybe this summer we're going to see some of these strategies and and the the modeling. Uh, maybe in the next month or so we might get a chance to look at some of the modeling, but it won't be till the summer till we see the strategies. Help me out there. I, I it looks like you're fairly close on the aquatic piece. Just missing what those cramp, you know, what the what the distances are, and some of the some of the details that are really important there. When are we going to see that? Yeah, maybe. Um, so thanks, Seth. This is Troy. I'll take a, a first shot there, and then Cindy or Brian or Liz might want to chime in. Um, you know, I think the the one thing that's important, and we've talked before about wanting to make sure that as we begin to roll out the the specifics around the strategies, the distances and the specific areas that would be part of the terrestrial strategy. We really want to make sure that they have gone through that process of, of you know, running through the timber harvest model. And so we put something out there that is viable, um, not something that we might have to then change you know, as a result of, of what the, the timber harvest model tells us. Um, so that's, I think that's the, the kind of the sequencing of it is related to that. Um, I think we are, I would, it's, we're probably still six weeks away from having um, all of the, and, and that's just more tied to the, the timing of the scoping team meetings, but all of the uh, terrestrial and riparian strategies, you know, I would say fully dialed in or initially dialed in. Um, and then sometime after that, we would be, you know, it'd be an iterative process. And I mean, if we got it right the first time and everything is sort of hunky dory, then we probably could get it out sooner. I suspect have some back and forth, um, you know, tweaking of the conservation strategies. And each of those tweaks would have to have more interaction and discussion with the scoping team to make sure that we're still aligned. So I think the timing is a little bit uncertain. And Brian's note about the summer is probably about right. Um, but I think more to come on the sequencing of that is, as it unfolds over, you know, April and May. That, that'd be my, my thought. Cindy or Brian, did you, you have a, a different approach? You know, I'd just say, set where sleeves rolled up, you know, dug in and working hard. Um, but recognizing we're kind of in uncertain times working from home and trying to do the best we can there with uh, balancing our families and, and all the restrictions with the social distancing. So our timeline is a little bit flexible. And then it really comes down to what Troy started with and, and Dave's concern there is when we present stuff out um, past the steering committee and into the public that it's something that we are confident will be successful. And until we do that modeling and have that iterative process of really looking at the results and analyzing it and seeing if it's in the best, excuse me, the best interest of the state of Oregon and the way we want to implement greatest form of value, um, we're not going to put that information out to the public. So as quickly as we can, we're going to get it there because we know it's important and we know a lot of people are interested in it, but we want to, make sure we are confident in what we're doing and, and get it right before we get it out there. So if I might, if I might ask the follow-up, uh, how does the Board of Forestry fit in with that? Uh, where do they fit in and, and when? Yeah, so absolutely. We had to adjust the April meeting um, and Liz started with that and more to come on that, but basically we had to take the HCP update off of there. We were never planning to, present the full strategies at that meeting and they know um, they knew that because we've been um, talking to individual board members quite a bit and keeping them up to date was well, been doing a great job at that. So the next um, opportunity we have will be in July and we'll update them with the most current information. And again, this gets back to, are we going to weigh out all those strategies in July or not? It, it depends. We got to see how much work we can get done between now and then. So then the real crux of it is is in October and we will present a very detailed report that analyzes um, the things we've been talking about in the last 20 minutes around the conservation contributions and the benefits to the species and then also the economic side of it 
and it will have some high level harvest levels in there at the forest wide level and some predictions um, of modeled results on the revenue, both costs and expenses and, and the financial viability of uh, the division on that. And then also the revenue distribution to the counties and local taxing districts. This is Liz, if I just weigh in real quickly here. I, the, that's all great. Thanks everyone for that conversation. And I would just add, appreciate people's patience while this work is getting done. And uh, we've all been, many of us have been through this before and know that there are um, junctures during these processes where uh, we just need to make sure we keep our focus and stay on track. And that's really where this team is right now and working hard to find alignment between the sister agencies, both state and federal sister agencies. And really um, with that focus have been having a lot of success. Um, and I know it's frustrating um, for parts of our stakeholder community that, that want to be in there as well. So I really do appreciate people's patience while we get through that stage. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as far as the, the analyses that are going to be presented to the board in October, it's never too soon to make sure people know that those are all considered relative, all those numbers will be considered really in a relative sense to help the board think about depending on which direction we go, uh, what are the relative outcomes on these multiple factors that, that we need to be providing off of this land base. That's, um, that's all I wanted to add. Yeah, appreciate that, Liz. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have about 20 minutes left. This is Deb with a little bit of voice left. And I'd like to make sure we get, we have four people with hands up. So I wanna just make sure I get to all of you. Joseph, you're up and then Craig's next, go ahead. Joseph, you should be unmuted. Yeah. If you're yeah, having trouble, you, Joseph, you're off mute, but if you're having trouble and if you're on your phone, you can message me your phone number and I can see if I can unmute your phone. This is Sylvia. So let me give Joseph a chance to try to see if that can work. And Craig, why don't you go ahead, if you don't mind, Sylvia, we'll jump over to Craig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Craig, you should be unmuted. Yes, thank you very much. My question is about greatest permanent value. And I, 53 years ago, I worked in a lumber mill with my grandfather that had worked in the lumber industry all his life. And it's gone downhill since. Um, in spades, 40 years ago, 71% of the employment in Lane County was wood products forestry based. Today, it's three to four to 5%. And that's not the exception, that's the truth everywhere. So how, where does, you know, the environment is another issue all, all, all together. I'm not even trying to look at that. I'm trying to say in terms of the economics and the social aspects of forestry as it's evolved over the last 60 years has been a total bust when it comes to greatest permanent value relative to human beings and, com and rural communities. And I've lived in a rural community for, for the last 45 years. I know firsthand what it's been like. So how do you not address that in your concept of greatest permanent value? I'll take that one. Uh, thank you, Craig. I, th I think we've chatted about this a couple of times. This is Liz. Bent with Department of Forestry. Um, well, actually, I would make a case that the greatest permanent value does squarely speak to rural communities, particular and with a real strong linkage to the counties, special relationship with the counties, and the revenue that's distributed from our timber sales to the counties, schools, and local taxing districts. I think relative to the land base that we manage, there's a um, significant contribution to rural communities with close to two thirds of the revenue that comes off of state forest timber sales going back to the, um, to those communities. Um, this, so that's one thing I would say, 
backing out a little bit farther, um, with greatest permanent value, it's a clear commitment to um, providing all of these benefits, which is a tall task, environmental, social, economic benefits, in the context of a working forest. So it clearly anchors to the notion that these forests will are working forests and there will be forest management and forest harvest that takes place in those forests. Um, the other services clearly with uh, recreation and education are the are, are larger scale sort of social benefit. I think that uh, what you're, you know, so I can say all that and it doesn't necessarily, it will not address the reality of the, the um, challenges that our rural communities are facing. And I don't have an anecdote to that. I don't think anyone can sit up here. I wouldn't want to sit up here and say, we've got it figured out. We're doing everything we can. Uh, what we can do and, and must do as stewards of these public lands is to manage them responsibly for the benefit of all Oregonians. And that's our charge and that's what we're working on. Well, I, I would just say that when you look at the school districts, the McKinsey School District where I live has 200 students in 13 grades. 35 years ago, there were 12 to 1400 students. And that's the case everywhere in all rural forested communities, because if you don't have jobs, you can't support families. And I would say that it's time that we look at the fact that there isn't anything sustainable about industrial forestry relative to communities and the ec economics that support those communities. There's no evidence for it. Yeah, and um, I th so to me, that's maybe a different conversation. We're talking about managing a public land base under public mandates for uh, all Oregonians. And so we have a different charge, a different mission mandate um, than do private landowners. And so I'm, you know, want to be in a position of um, making some sort of overarching statement around um, industrial force practices. And um, oh, yeah. oh, um, pardon me. Oh no, I wanted to let you finish. Go ahead. That's good. I'm done. Um, well, thank you. I want to say thank you, Craig, for the question. Thank you, Liz, for the conversation and the answers. And I'm going to need to be moving on here to catch just a few more people before we have to wrap up. So, Sylvia, it looks to me like I've got Connie Moore and Doug Cooper next. So, yeah. Connie, I think you can and go ahead. And just an update, Joseph Yorin um, said that he'd submit his comments in writing. He lowered his hand. Oh, okay. So go ahead, I, Connie. I noticed he was gone. Okay. Oh, okay, because I was going to say I've been on a couple of times and I didn't think Doug had. And so I was wanting to make sure he had time. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say because, uh, you know, I do appreciate everything that ODF does. And if I had sounded critical in the past, I didn't mean to, you know, I realize that we're waiting in trenches of the last hundred plus years of how we think about things, how we do things. And, um, you know, I, I do want everybody to be whole at the end of um, our, our seventh generation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just looking at how, you know, all the pieces on how we can do that and, you know, factoring in climate change. And in my opinion, funding is not only appropriate, you know, different funding for our schools and communities, but also for the small timber people. You know, I don't think we should leave them out. I think that as we transition to some, to a more sustainable model, that everybody should be made whole. And that's my goal. Thank you, Connie. That's, um, that's a really important sentiment for us all to keep in mind. Appreciate it. Thank you, Connie. And so, yeah, mm -hmm, I'm done. Oh, all right. Thank you again, Connie. Appreciate it. Yeah. And Doug Cooper, why don't you go ahead? And Doug, for some reason, I can't unmute you on my end. So you may need to unmute yourself. Or if you're calling from a phone, um, if you 
chat over the phone number you're calling from. I can see if that's the issue. Uh, let's there see. You can you hear me? Right now? Here. There yeah. we go. Gotcha. Gotcha. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I guess first, just a quick comment. I mean, I think uh, most people on the call probably, you know, have confidence that forest management on state, federal, private land, you know, is and can be sustainable and whether or not it's characterized as industrial or something else, I, I don't think really is, you know, germane to the conversation that's going on here today. So uh, this may be able to be taken offline, so it's back to the harvest modeling, but a real quick question maybe for Troy. Um, back, or Cindy uh, for that matter, back when the initial uh, business case analysis was presented, there were harvest modeling figures that were presented at that time, and I think that went a long way to the persuasion or influence that the board had in um, supporting pursuit of the HCP to this point. How do you characterize uh, that modeling that was done that generated the harvest volume and revenue figures to the current level of, we'll call it policy level modeling? Um, and then a follow-up question after that. Yeah, maybe Cindy, I'll go first, or Cindy or Brian, and then if you want to uh, weigh in after that, happy to have you do that. Um, thanks, Doug, for the question. I think in, in terms of level of detail, um, that's a, that's a really good that's a really good question. I think in terms of level of detail between what you saw in that versus what you might expect here, in some ways. Um, you know, I would say same level of detail in terms of, you know, kind of like uh, gross numbers, if you will. Um, in other ways, the information in this, in this up, upcoming comparative analysis and in, in the timber harvest, the policy level timber harvest modeling we're doing now, uh, in some ways the detail will be, um, there will be more detail in only because, you know, the information has, has been updated a little bit. Um, some of the, um, Certainly, the assumptions around what the HCP will be will be greatly different. Because if you remember in the business case, we were sort of guessing. We were you know, based on other similar examples, and now that's will be more dialed in. So on the timber, on the policy level, timber harvest modeling side, maybe kind of same level of detail. But I would say that the confidence in those numbers and how acres will move uh, in terms of what's accessible versus inex inaccessible. Uh, we'll have, I, I think, more confidence in the numbers now than we did back then. Um, whether or not the level of detail changes too much, it's more refinement on the on the approach as we put two more years into it, basically. Cindy or Brian, do you want to add any on that? Yeah, I think that's right, Troy. And also, um, not just the timber harvest modeling, but the species modeling that we Um, a lot of the difference between HCP and our current FMP was around for listed species and what that actually looks like on the landscape, as well as our conservation strategies that we know that we are going to be implementing over time. So um, I would say, yeah, just echoing what, what Troy said in terms of it being at still at a, at a high level and there will still need to be some assumptions that are made, but we certainly have a lot more confidence on the HCP side um, in terms of those, the projections for species. My follow-up uh, real quick is just, um, I, I had thought, some time ago that uh, there would be harvest model figures available here in April. Uh, and, and is that still the case at the policy level? I'll, I'll take that one. Um, Doug, this is Brian and no, we are definitely um, moving a little bit slower on a couple of fronts um, for many different reasons, not not just the, the pandemic. What we are doing in April is um, sitting down with you and other, uh, the experts, um, 
at first week in April and, and talking more about the details of the modeling. But the reason we're delayed again is um, continuing to set up and field check the base model, but then also the development of the conservation strategies, both the riparian and the terrestrial have not come along as fast as we want. And again, there's no issues there other than there is a lot of information for the technical experts to wade through and we're trying to get it right. So I know, not sure when we met with you last, maybe it seems like it was in January, early February, and we we're hoping for April, but that's uh, pushed out a couple months now. Okay, thanks. Well, Doug, thank you so much for those questions and thank you folks for the answers and the interaction about it. Um, we are nearing the time where we need to wrap up. And I just want to leave an opportunity as I'm starting to get into next steps. If there's anybody else that wish they had a chance to ask a question, either go ahead and raise your hand or drop a comment in the, in the group chat. Um, I also want to um, just let everybody know that folks are able to keep talking. And they always want to be able to keep talking throughout. So if there's something else you need that you either don't have time for today or just want a different forum, your ODF team, your project team, ICF are all here for you for one-on-one -on -one conversations, for small group conversations, whatever the, it is that helps you get those issues, concerns out there and get the kind of conversation and dialogue you need. So please don't hesitate to reach out, either send something in through to Jason through that email address, drop something off in the group chat before you go, or just find one of the folks that you have met here on this call or at other times. And again, please don't hesitate. The next opportunity for an open and public meeting is we think somewhere in the May, June framework timeframe, um, we'll of course reach out when that's ready to happen. And if it's not just a kind of one-on-one, -on -one, let us know if there's a topic you'd like to engage on with more of a kind of focus group or a small group discussion and also glad to do that. Um, I think that might be it. Can folks help me? Is there anything else, project team, I should have said? Um, I'm going to turn it back to Liz and for the wrap up, but I just want to check. Cindy, anything else? Yeah, I would just like to um, echo Liz's appreciation for the patience of the stakeholders. I know that you've been waiting for more details and we are working hard on them. It is so iterative, however, not only combining riparian with terrestrial and we get those figured out, but then integrating that with the timber harvest model. And then we look at cost and funding strategy and monitoring and adaptive management. So there's a lot of layers to this before we want to give out something that you know we've agreed to in principle with the services. We do plan on having, so we're gonna have basically a lot of these work products ready at the same time. So it's gonna be a lot to digest likely towards the end of the summer. So uh, more towards sort of the, the end of July, early August timeframe, we would be looking to have a meeting open to the public that has these details. It's gonna be a lot to digest, so we're gonna, hopefully we'll be able to do this in person, who knows where we're gonna be at that time, but um, we'd be looking at maybe structuring it differently so that you can um, have sort of focused sessions during the day to learn and ask questions about each of the topics. So I, I do just want to let you know that um, we haven't forgot about you. We are feeling it and we're working as 